All right, we'll call the uh, meeting to order. Um, the joint meeting tonight for the first half with you, bud. Um, first order of business is to approve the agenda. Can I make a motion to approve the agenda? Is there a second? A second? I have a couple of addendums to the agenda. What you got? Uh, one, just a quick um, presentation by, from the Waterbury Rotary. It'll take probably two minutes. And the second would be um, recognizing Tom Messner's 31 years in meteorology and I'm um, suggesting that possibly we have the first day of winter dedicated as Tom Mester Day. Okay, so I'll add those. Hopefully a pretty quick session. I'll add those uh, C and F where we can fall under D on select board business and that work. Um, all right, any other changes, revisions? Mm -hmm. If not, I will take the same. Are you okay with the modification of the motion? Yeah. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, select board consent agenda items, minutes from November 15th meeting. Any motion? Motion I move to approve the consent agenda items. All right. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Who did a second on that? I'm sorry. Chris. No. Mike seconded. Right? Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is public. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to speak not on anything that's currently on the agenda. Um, we will do our best to give everyone an opportunity to speak. I know there's some items that um, folks hope to discuss tonight. Um, I am gonna limit discussion to a minute a person because we have quite a few people that are attending. Um, I also ask that everyone just understand that there's probably a lot of opinions on some of the things we're gonna discuss. I just would like to keep it civil. Um, I think one of the important things that we have at town meeting is there should be no clapping, there should be no cheering. Um, I think it's intimidating for people to speak. So I just ask that, um, what we have done in the previous meetings that we've just lined up over here. Um, we don't have a microphone like we've had in the past, so once we get up to an item that you'd like to um, throw in your, your voice on, just please line up here and we'll just go down and um, we'll do everything we can to give everyone a chance to speak. Mark? Yeah. Um, if you would, I'd ask you to reconsider that one minute time frame to maybe two minutes because it's really, that's really quite short. Um, yeah, we should, how many people we have online? Uh, uh, one, two, three, or at least four, 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 uh, ten or so. It's difficult to allow people to speak again when they're in the mindset of Yeah, mind. I'm just a little well, concerned of how well, late this might go. Maybe we should have poll how many people want to speak in the public. That's what I was going to say. Sure. How many people are hoping to speak tonight? <clears throat> Probably 20 minutes. Um, I mean, 10, 20 people is, I mean, I don't know. Um, We've had longer discussions with less important issues. Sure, I'm just wondering if there's going to be a lot of movement of opinion, but just um, we can consider. Sure. Um, we'll go ahead and limit it at two minutes a person. That's fine. Thank you. Do you need more time to um, So like I said, is there anything anyone wants to discuss in the public that's not on the agenda? This is an opportunity to do that right now. Okay. Um, does yeah, that have a question? Have someone right here, I see. Sorry, I didn't see it. Yeah, I just have, is this normal for city council to have their backs towards yeah. the community? It's very odd. I just find this very odd. The reason that that's all I wanted, that's all I wanted no to say. I think some of it is because we've transitioned out from Zoom only meetings, and there's this little owl thing that rotates and films us as we talk to uh, the folks. But um, I'll ask the board to do everything they can to 
It's a little struggle. You have to be loud enough to get this camera to come and, this is and film you. Why isn't it recognizing Marcus? He's not, he doesn't speak loud enough. I'm probably not <laughs> speaking loud enough. Loud enough. We, used, we used the prior, too. When you got okay. Oh, yeah. We used yeah. to be in front. Yeah. And that answers the question. question. Yeah. It's more technology. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else? Sorry, Mr. Dean. No, that's okay. okay. You weren't facing me, that's all. <laughs> um, all right, uh, does EFA need to open our meeting? It's like there, you can do it. He wants you to open your meeting. Oh, I was going to wait the, get down to the business there. I think I'm there. Oh, okay. Uh, call the uh, meeting of the uh, Edward Ferrari Building District to order for the joint meeting on uh, Monday, December 6th. Um, Bob is uh, a member of the committee and he's on Zoom there. And Natalie Howell, let me say, and myself are the commissioners here. Um, and uh, he want us to approve the agenda with the printed here. Um, it's up to you if you think you need to do it. I think we're okay. If not. Somebody's calling it, and it's my own name. <laughs> well, unless EFUD has any changes, right. I think a simple nod is probably good enough. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, welcome. We haven't had a joint meeting in a while. Um, first item is consider use of ARPA funds and revolving loan funds. Okay. I'm going to take my mask off to try to help people hear better. Um, I was hoping that the people in the back could see me on the screen, but for some reason with all these people on there. We could pin the speaker, Carla, to make him, or yeah, speaker view. Right, speaker view. Okay. <clears throat> and then maybe ask everyone to mute if they're not speaking. You start speaking now, I think it will flip the yeah. Okay, um, so this is a little bit awkward, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to bear with me, and I'm, I'm gonna talk for several minutes here, um, and I'm gonna talk about the American Rescue Plan and how certain things uh, can go forward in the, in this community. Um, I recognize that I am the municipal manager. I am not a policymaker. It is not my job to tell the boards uh, where this community is going to go, but normally it is to work with you, find out where the community board members want to go, and then help get you there. But I think um, we're in a unique situation. Uh, in, in time with this pandemic, with the ARPA money that's coming from Congress, from the federal government, and where we are in this community. I think I have a unique viewpoint, viewpoint a unique vantage point when looking at community needs and, and assets uh, and opportunities. And if you would indulge me, I would ask that you let me read a statement, uh, and then uh, I'm going to pass out to the board some information, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, I'm not asking for or anticipating any hard, fast decisions being made tonight. This is uh, my attempt to move us forward to where I think the community needs to go. So I'm going to. Uh, take a few minutes to read, and then uh, uh, we'll get back to it when I can pass out some information. So the American Rescue Plan became law on March 11th, 2021, when the act was passed by Congress and signed by President Biden. Though the federal money, though the federal government sent money appropriated for municipalities and counties across the country through the states in which they are located, the money being passed through these to these local governments is all federal. 
No state rules or regulations are attached. Only federal law and rulemaking apply. This is the first time since 1986, which was the last year of the federal revenue sharing program that started under President Nixon in the 1970s, that federal government has provided the direct aid to municipalities. The share allotted to be paid to municipalities works out to be about $100 per capita. For the purposes of ARPA, most villages, utility districts, and fire districts are not eligible for direct ARPA payments. But those entities are eligible to receive payments from their, in quotes, parent cities and towns. Therefore, they could be subrecipients. Mm -hmm. Waterbury's population for the 2020 census is just shy of 5,400 persons. On August 10th this year, Waterbury received the first half of its ARPA allotment. $269,833. The second half of the allotment should be deposited into the bank's account in the first quarter of 2022. In New England, as county government provides almost no direct services to the public, the act allows the states to direct the county allotments to cities and towns located in those in the individual, in the individual account, yeah, in the individual counties. On September 9th, Waterbury received the first half of its county share from the state. That payment was just shy of $500,650. The second payment of the county share money is also expected to arrive in the first quarter of 2022. When all is received, the ARPA payment to Waterbury is expected to be $1,554,964. As these funds, the half that we've already received, have been deposited into an interest-bearing account, the fund balance will grow higher over time until it begins to be spent for appropriate purposes. And we have until 2026, as an aside, to actually spend the money, so there's no real hurry. But as long as the money is not spent, it will, it will earn interest. So here's where we're going to get into some uh, areas where folks might view me more as a politician as opposed to a manager. But I'm going to take that uh, leap of faith and hope you'll follow me with it. In my opinion, these federal funds that are being made available to Waterbury have the potential to, have the potential to be transformational for our community. We have to be willing to think outside the box, and we should be willing to do things that have never been done that way here before. While I don't expect approvals to be granted tonight for all the things I propose, I am convinced they do need to happen. I am convinced that if we do these things, our community will operate more effectively and be able to achieve a greater good at lower costs and our aggregate, our aggregate resources will be better utilized. In short, and in my opinion, the potential economic and community development, potential for economic and community development will be enhanced. I've worked in Waterbury for almost 40, 34 years now. Though we've taken some big strides of late to consolidate governments and their functions under almost one umbrella with almost a unified staff, I still work for two government entities and four elected boards, but that's a different story for another time. Through the use of funds coming our way through ARPA and the recently passed Federal Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, which we're just learning about now, that's the Infrastructure Act that you've probably heard about. I believe it is time for Watery and EFA to begin to take steps to merge completely. In a community with more than, with fewer than 5,500 residents, one local government is surely enough. That the bugaboo of inequitable tax rates between the town and villages behind us, given the dissolution of the village in 2018, it seems the time is right and the infusion of this federal money makes it even a more attractive goal. Of course, this merger cannot be achieved tonight, and perhaps the recommendations I, I outline now 
cannot be approved tonight either. But they should be, and I think they should be no later than town meeting day. Now I'm going to pass out to the board some information, and I'm going to walk through it and amplify things a bit. So, there are many moving parts to this proposal. They include a private water distribution system that serves the Nail and Flats Mobile Home Park. It includes the Watery Ice Center the Ice Center of Washington West. It includes the UDAG revolving loan fund that EFUD owns, and EFUD's CDBG revolving loan fund, and also EFUD land being considered for transfer to the town. I'm gonna to go over this fairly quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, Skip. I forgot you folks were back there. That's why I thought you'd be sitting at the table. The ARPA money is not money that is raised locally by our property taxes. It's money that is available through the federal government. And it's coming to us as a grant. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of, of how we can use the money, but some money is available to be used uh, to replace lost revenue, revenue that we lost in 2020 compared to 2019, and again in 2021 compared to 2020 uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and, and I've been working with folks from the LCT and our accounting company, Nemric, to uh, identify the lost revenue. Uh, and this is something that cities and towns all across the state are doing now. Anyway, here's what I propose. Of the one and a half million dollars plus that the town has in ARPA as of uh, early next year, I will recommend that the town appropriate 600,000 of that to EFUD. The town will have a remaining balance in ARPA of $940,965. There's a mobile home park on Newland Flats, the Newland Flats Mobile Home Park, Newland Flats Trailer Park. All of you, I'm um, sure, are familiar with it. A number of years ago, the owners of that park, Mr. and Mrs. Peck, came to the village of Waterbury and said, we're having trouble with our water system. Uh, we need to get on to the village's water system. Um, I likely recommended to the commissioners that, well, we can get them hooked up, but they need to pay to bring the water to the park. And they did. They paid over $200,000 to extend the village's water system from down near Twin Peaks up to the Neal and Flats Trailer Park, and they brought it into the park. And at that point, they used their existing distribution system that they used to have their wells hooked up to to provide water to those residents. Um, the EFUD commissioners really do understand that state law um, makes them responsible for the quality of the water at the tap of all of those individual mobile home units. Uh, but that water system that, that, that services those mobile homes, that distribution system, is still owned by the PECs. Uh, they're a water customer, they pay water bills. The people that live in that park deserve to have a water system that's fully owned by the municipality. And in this case, that's EFUT. Um, $600,000 should do that job. I think maybe it will do more than that job, but that's for a different time. I'm also recommending that EFUT either forgives or restructures a $530,000 UDAC loan that's outstanding to the ICE Center of Washington West. And 
when they do that, and we, we'll talk about the details of the forgiveness or the restructuring. At this point, I think restructuring is probably better. But I, I'm going to recommend that they forgive that loan, in effect, to the ICE Center. After the town pays EFUD $600,000 to allow them to do the work in the Neal and Flats mobile home park, I'm going to recommend that EFUD transfer ownership of its UDAG fund and its community development revolving loan fund to the town. Those two funds, net of the ICE Center loan, uh, is worth $670,000 and change today. I'm also going to, I'm going to suggest that the town at town meeting consider appropriating $100,000 to the ICE Center to pay for the replacement of its cooling tower. Um, and then also to add some money to their equipment reserve fund. I believe this appropriation can be made from the ARPA funds, so it doesn't necessarily have to cost the taxpayers anything. We've talked with EFOD, the select board and EFOD have been in discussions over the last several months about transferring land from EFOD to the town uh, for parcels in particular, one of which is the site where the ICE Center is located and 40 acres of other land that is used for partly for recreation purposes and partly for material storage areas. I would suggest that that transfer uh, be put on hold until the merger that I described is either completed or that the process is exhausted and we find that it can't be done. And I hope that can happen within a year. I think that is very reasonable given that EFUD has no services that it offers the public for taxes and only has a water and sewer system which are paid by the ratepayers. So there's, there's, there's no, there should be no real uh, angst about merging and coming <coughs> under one government. <clears throat> and I would suggest that that process uh, of merger between EFUD and the town be used, uh, that the town use that time as an opportunity to write a charter for itself to uh, lay out uh, a proposal to the legislature for how it wants to govern itself in the future. Uh, and when I say that, you know, if this merger happens, would the select board be responsible for everything they're responsible for now, plus water and sewer? Perhaps the select board would uh, say, no, we should still elect water and sewer commissioners, but instead of just from the EFOD district, they could be any town resident. Or maybe the select board would say, well, we still want a water sewer commission, but they should be appointed by the select board as they have very specific duties. Those are all things that we can talk about in the future. I'm almost done. I'm going to pass these out. I'm going to go back to the desk. Yeah, three, two. Do you see the last piece? Yep. Bob's on. Okay. So to the elephant in the room probably, when people heard that I'm suggesting uh, forgiving or restructuring the ICE Center's debt, let me expand on that a little bit. There is precedent in both the town and the EFOD forgiveness of loans to made to local not-for-profit organizations. The Seminary Building and Waterbury Center and the Stimson Graves Building on Stowe Street are two prime examples. If you look at what I just passed out, if you look at page one, you'll see that that is the town's community development fund from 2005. And you can see there were three loans outstanding at the time, a $336,700 loan, um, and then a, a almost $9,800 loan, and about a $66,300 loan. 
The two smaller loans were loans made from CDBG funds that had been granted to the town earlier in time, had been loaned out and partially repaid back to the town. The town applied for a grant to help with the renovation of the seminary building, turning it into affordable housing. The grant that was received to do that was this $336,700. It was a community development block grant lent to the town. The town used that money and then uh, lent additional funds into that project. The, the two smaller loans were intended to be paid back with interest. If you look at your next page, mark two at the top, you'll see that that $20,000 seminary note and that $80,000 seminary note are at zero. Uh, this is current year, but that $336,700 note is still outstanding. That loan was made to the, to the developers of that. I um, can't remember if it's Down Street or I believe it is. Down Street is involved in that. It wasn't Down Street at the time. That $336,000 loan was made for a term where principal and interest was suspended for that whole term with a balloon payment at the end with the expectation when the end of the period comes, the loan would be waived. So the select board has not technically waived that $336,700 note as of yet. If you look at the next page, page three, this is the EFUDS community development fund. You'll see there a $535,000 loan to Stimson Graves Building. And you'll see uh, $72,071 as a loan to the um, Ladd Hall Limited Partnership, which is the affordable housing at Ladd Hall, which was part of the state complex until it was flooded out in Tropical Storm Irene. The, the village at the time lent $74,000 of community development block grant into that Ladd Hall project. There's a very complicated amortization schedule there. Um, Down Street has only paid a couple of thousand dollars of that back, but that money will come back to the community. But if you notice, oh man, <laughs> did they all go? That light bulb blew. Oh. Well, I hope they can still see and hear us. Can they hear? They can hear you. Let's oh. see. We just can't see. Yeah. For how long? Yeah. Possible. Yeah. 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 Right. If you turn to page four, you'll see in 2019, Ooh. you'll see in 2019 that the $72,000 at Ladd Hall loan is still there, but the $535,000 Stimson Graves loan is not there. Uh, in 2019, the E flight commissioners. Excuse me, I just got confirmation that people can still see and hear us. Yeah, we and did. I got confirmation that there's power outages in town. Yeah. From my home. Thank you. Yeah, my We're probably working on it, Jen. Yeah. Anyway, um, the E flight commissioners in 2019, in November of 2019, uh, the the. 30 year, the 19th, that $530,000, $535,000 was lent to Stimson Graves project in 1989 when revitalizing Waterbury was born and, and tried to, to uh, prevent that building from being torn down. And now it's a, a key uh, community center. The Senior Citizen Center is there and elderly housing is in that building. The, e flood commissioners forgave that loan as anticipated when that uh, balloon payment came up. Um, I'm not sure why. Looks like page five is the 
almost the same as page four. Don't worry about page five. If you go to page six, if you go to page six, you'll see this is the village's UDAG fund, EFUD's UDAG fund. You can see there in the middle of the page on the assets above where I've highlighted, there's the loan to the ICE Center of $523,915. This is from 2019. You'll also see a loan there, $202,500 to revitalizing Waterbury, which ultimately got transferred to Downstreet in, in the process of uh, transferring that property. Uh, and you see $63,075 down at the bottom as uh, accrued interest. Um, the CDBG loan, that $535,000, the, the EFUD commissioners forgave the entire loan and accrued interest. So on that, I, I think that's my point was um, accrued interest. Anyway, the UDAG fund, um, in 2019, at the same time, in November, the EFUD commissioners wrote off that $202,500 UDAG loan, but collected the $63,075 of interest. So uh, there's some examples of federal money, which was passed through the state, that came to the community, that was lent for community development purposes, that was then forgiven by the entity that loaned it because it was the right thing to do in order to uh, foster the, the economic uh, vitality of our community and meet community needs, both housing needs in those cases. If you continue looking on, well, if you look at page seven now, this is the last page, You'll see there that the revitalizing water loan is gone. It's zero, and the accrued interest is gone, and I just told you how that happened. You'll also see that the ICE Center loan is now 529.802. That seems counterintuitive, but over time, um, the, the uh, that loan that was made to the ICE Center has been restructured and refinanced to the benefit of the ICE Center by EFUD. So those are, that's the precedent for forgiveness of, of loans. Why do I think that we should do this? And at the bottom of that page that I had handed out, the narrative, uh, before it says there are many moving parts, it says, um, there's a great deal of pressure from the public right now to improve recreation facilities on land owned by our two municipalities. I think these proposals should be explored. I believe they are uh, possible, but I believe it should happen only after we take steps necessary to protect the recreational gem that we have in this community now that almost nobody in the local government ever thinks about, which almost costs nothing, uh, but is, uh, is a vital part of our community. And the multiplier effects, I'm not an, econo an economist and I don't have, I didn't have the time even if I was to do this, but, <clears throat> You know, there's probably, um, there, there's, Katie would know better than I, but you know, uh, high school hockey team, girls and boys, both teams I'm sure probably 15, 18 kids on each team. They both have 20 game seasons. They play 10 games at home each. So that's 20 games that they're playing at home where other teams from other communities come here and play. Then you've got the Harwood Youth Hockey, which is from ages five to about, you know, freshman in high school when the Bantams are graduating and those who are interested in try out for the high school team move up to high school sports. But 
you know, there's, there's scores more kids. I don't know the number of kids that are playing down there. And, you know, those kids uh, practice two or three times a week, and they play a game. And when I was in youth hockey, because I grew up in a big city, we had a house league. We practiced and we played, and we played amongst teams in our own, in our own league. And then it was uh, an all-star team or a traveling team that was comprised of, of better players, maybe, that, that travel. But the Harwood Youth Hockey League, for the most part, they play kids from other communities, and they go to other communities. So there's people from all over central Vermont, at least, coming here from, uh, you know, Basically, I think the hockey season in terms of game probably starts in November, but they're practicing from November to March. There's a lot of people that come to this community and spend money here in restaurants, at gas stations, sometimes, I'm sure, even in hotels, uh, in the shops in this community. That ice center costs us almost nothing, uh, except maybe if you want to count the time that I've put in over the past, especially five years or so, to try to uh, to try to do things to help them out, understanding that you know uh, they've got to generate a lot of income to pay their bills. The the and they've never missed a loan payment. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go on here a little bit. Um, they never missed a loan payment, but in uh, in two thousand in nineteen ninety eight, so that's a long time ago, twenty five years. The town appropriated ninety thousand dollars to extend the road down to the ice center. And then in 2003, when it was necessary, when it was actually done, $25,000 more was appropriated. So altogether, the town appropriated $115,000 to send the, to extend the road to the ice center. The cost of it was actually $109,000. In the same year, 1998, the village appropriated $225,000 to bring the water and the sewer mains to the ice center. Uh, the cost of it was about 195000 so it didn't cost as much as the appropriation was. I believed and still suspect that the ICE Center paid that money back to the village, but I can't find that they did, and I ran out of time looking, so I'm going to assume that they didn't. So altogether, between the road and the $195,000 to bring water and sewer to the ICE Center, the community spent about $305,000 to get those two pieces of infrastructure down there. So the ICE Center opened in 2003 or four. So I, I just divided that 304,000 by 18 years. And it came out to $16,900 a year. And there was interest that had to be paid on those notes that the town took anyway. Uh, the, I know the motion to build the uh, water and sewer mains, the village voted to use money that they had, uh, that they had uh, garnered through sale of timber up in the waterworks, and, and they didn't have to finance that. But even if you include the interest that the town had to likely pay on a, on a five-year note, uh, if you round that up to $20,000 a year, I think that's a lot. That, so that's what the public infrastructure, that $305,000 uh, cost the town about $20,000 $20, a year. In 2003, the ICE Center entered into a 99-year lease and leases the site from the village for uh, $10 a year, bargain basement price. The village in 2003 billed the ICE Center $56,255 for water sewer allocation. They financed it, I believe, over 10 years, allowing the ICE Center to pay that $56,000 over 10 years. In 2004, the ICE Center lent 
borrowed uh, $500,000 from the UDAG fund and financed it over 30 years. They had debt from commercial lenders as well. Uh, their total debt was over $1.2 million. Uh, here we are now, 18 years later, they still owe the ICE Center $530,000, but they've paid down the other debt. Their total debt is in the $840,000 range right now. And the reason why they still owe $530,000 to the ICE Center is that I have recommended to the Water Sewer Commissioners, or to the EFLUD Commissioners, I mean, several times over the past decade to loan the ICE Center more money at a lower rate so they could pay off and pay down that commercial debt that they have. They still have some debt uh, with a local bank, uh, not to be named, that's over 6% interest. And, and I have worked, I've tried to encourage that bank to, to refinance that, given the low interest rate environment. EFI hasn't been able to have enough money to take on all that debt, but they have refinanced, allowed the ICE Center to pay down debt, and uh, the, the loan of $530,000 is to the ICE Center at 2%. Now, as an aside, when the pandemic hit in 2020, uh, four months, I think, after the last refinancing, and that's you saw in 2019 that the ICE Center's debt was like 523 and it went up to 530. A few months after the last refinancing, the pandemic hit, shut everything down. The EFLUD Commission is upon recommendation from me suspended principal and interest payments on all UDAG loans for all UDAG borrowers uh, and have not turned on that switch yet. So all of those borrowers uh, save two new borrowers who just borrowed money within the last couple of years are right now uh, saving their principal and interest, being able to use that to put into their businesses, hoping that they can get out of the other end of the pandemic still operating. So the ICE Center's debt is $530,000. They're not paying anything down on that right now. In contrast, the banks told them, we'll suspend your interest in principal payments as well. You don't have to pay during the pandemic. But we're going to keep the meter running on the interest. So every month that they don't pay, they end up having to, to uh, you know, see their, their interest, their total uh, uh, total debt go up. So EFUD, I think, has been instrumental in helping to keep the ICE Center uh, viable. Um, in, when, the town, when the town and the village uh, invested that money in the ICE Center, and I was probably the principal advocate for saying, oh, we can't give them a tax break. They should pay taxes. And if they ever get themselves considered tax exempt from the legislature, they need to pay a payment in lieu of taxes to the municipality. Now, almost every other not-for-profit that's out there doesn't pay any taxes at all. And we squawk about that. We just went through a, uh, uh, settled a case with the daycare center down the, down the road about that. But the ICE Center um, said, we're not going to ask the community for, for money. And we said, OK, that's great, but we want you to pay taxes. So they paid taxes. Um, and, it, and, and then there were, there's been three times where the legislature took action. Anyway, um, the ICE Center um, entered into an agreement to pay taxes to the uh, town and to the village. In 2006, for two years, EFUD suspended the principal and interest payments on the loan to allow them to pay down their water sewer allocations quicker. The water sewer allocations were financed. They were at a higher interest rate than the loan was. And I said, well, if they can pay that and get that paid back to the, to the water and sewer fund, which needed the money, and you can't give money from 
you know, the, the UDAG revolving loan fund to support operations of the water and sewer system. It needs to be revenue there. So to get that $56,000 back or into the coffers of the village quicker so it could be used for water and sewer, they suspended that UDAG payment. In 2010, we had made a mistake, and I'll say me, we had made a mistake in terms of the bill that we were sending to the ICE Center for payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, the legislature had granted uh, an exemption to the ICE Center for the education tax, um, and we we failed to send them the right uh, the right bill for that uh, pilot payment to the town and village. In 2010, because of our mistake, we agreed to abate $32,000 of taxes that we hadn't really billed them for. Uh, but we said, you're still responsible for the $18,000 that you owe to the town and the village. Um, the village had received that money from the town, and that's a long story, $5,600 was the village tax. So there was 12518 that they still owed the town. The village agreed once again to suspend their UDAG payment to let them make that tax payment to the town quicker, and they did that in about a year, and then the, the, uh, the uh, uh, amortization of that, of that loan started again. In 2011, at a town meeting that uh, several of us were at, the town uh, presented a proposal to the voters to say, we'll exempt the ICE Center from taxes, and we'll agree to pay the ICE Center's education tax as long as the ICE Center continues to pay us the municipal tax. The town voted to do that. We had to install that fourth tax rate. So if you look at your tax bills now, you see there's a 0.0018 tax rate for veterans exemptions for disabled vets. There's a similar small tax rate for the education tax that we're paying on behalf of the, uh, the Hunger Mountain Child Center right now. We had to do that for the ICE Center. So we paid their education tax. And then in 2016, I think it was, the state finally exempted the ICE Center from all taxes. We don't have to pay that education tax on their behalf anymore. And in 2019, the select board agreed not to charge the municipal tax to the ICE Center any longer. It was only a couple thousand dollars. And we said, the village is out of business. There's no more police department. We just let it, let it go. I've talked about the ICE Center uh, having their debt restructured several times by EFUD since 2016 in particular. So here's the ICE Center who has generated a customer base, sold ICE time over the years. They've paid all their bills. They've paid taxes. They've paid their debt. And they never missed any of those payments. And now the pandemic comes and they're starting to see some struggles. They lost almost all of 2020 in terms of revenue. All their bills didn't go away. They've never asked the municipality for anything. But I kind of scratched my head when I was going through this, and I said, I wonder how much money we've given to other not-for-profits since 2003. So I went and I, I added it all up today. Between 2003 and 2021, except for the direct, those, the direct payments that we made to the ICE Center or for the infrastructure, the road and the water and sewer mains being brought down there. And then indirect assistance that I've described, which is refinancing, shuffling the deck helping them to have lower debt payments to other, to other entities so that they could continue to stay in business on our behalf or for our behalf. Since that time, 
And with that very minimal, and I, as I said, I think you can count it, maybe $20,000 a year has been uh, provided to that organization that I think does so much for this community. In that time, the town, for special articles, has appropriated $1,248,500 to not-for-profit organizations through our special article process at town meeting. That amounts to $65,710 every year for the last 18 years, 19 years. It is. Included in that $1,248,500 is $535,000, $535,200 to be exact, that's been appropriated to the Senior Center, and $73,500 that's been appropriated to the Children's Room. And I don't begrudge making those payments to either of those entities. The reason I specified those two is because those two are the only organizations on that list that actually are in town and do something directly for people in the community. Now, there's all kinds of other good not-for-profit organizations that are countywide, and I'm not saying that they don't provide service to the community, but these two organizations um, are, are um, you know, the, the two that have the biggest presence and I think provide the most direct service to Waterbury residents. In addition to that $1.2 million plus, since 2012, the town has appropriated $183,000 to support the general operation budget of revitalizing Waterbury and an additional 264225 for its economic development director position. And again, I'm happy that we've done that. I'm not suggesting that we should have appropriated less or that we shouldn't do it any longer. What I'm saying is that there's a lot of effort that have been made to help out these organizations RW is a definite partner of ours. We work very closely with them. They've done a lot of work in the, in the community to try to help encourage and, and foster business. Uh, they run programs that bring people into this community, like the Arts Fest. They help with the, with the auto show. Uh, the economic development director's position, I think, has been invaluable. Um, they, they did great work through the three-year uh, Main Street reconstruction project. Uh, and, and we had additional grant money that we funneled to them to do that work that's not included in this. So having said all that, I've come to the end of my um, speech, the end of my uh, plea, if you will. Um, the ICE Center, if it were up to me at this stage of the game, probably should be taken over by the town. But I don't think that there's stomach to do that. Uh, maybe on this board, I'm not sure the community is ready to do that. There are certain things that uh, could be a lot cheaper if the town owned the, owned the facility and ran it. Um, general liability insurance in particular, that is the first thing that pops to mind. Um, but I think that if we want this organization to continue to exist, we really need to do the things that I've suggested here. And why? Because there are a handful of persons at the ICE Center, four or five people who are on the board. They've been on the board since the 1990s. I don't know how much they raised to help build the ice center. They had to borrow $1.2 million in addition to what they raised. They run that facility. They pay a staff. They're doing an excellent job. They're providing an excellent service to the community. If we want them to continue doing it so we don't have to, I think we need to help them do this. The reason why I talked about restructuring debt 
as opposed to forgiving the debt, which last week I thought forgiving the debt was the best idea. But if we restructured the debt and did what we did for the Stimson and Graves building and for the seminary building and said that $530,000 is, um, is going to be no principal and interest payments for the next 20 years and at uh, 20 years out there'll be a balloon payment due which means you get to renegotiate the terms of the loan. I would hope that at that point it would be forgiven, just like those two loans that I shared about a little while ago were forgiven. But the reason I don't think we should forgive that now is if the ICE Center, in its current um, uh, governance structure, a not-for-profit board of directors, volunteer people, if they can't make it, and then some of you have served on boards for 20 or 25 years or more, and you know it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time, and you've got a professional staff here to help you with a lot of other things. The people that are volunteering to do that job, they've got a couple of paid staff, mostly part-time people. They've got volunteers who are, who are doing the work as a treasurer. Um, you know, it's, it's a big effort. If, if they go under, if, if EFUD gets, wants to play hardball with them and says, you know what, we're turning on the loan um, and we're going to start charging you 2% uh, and we're going to, because the, the, the suspension of principal and interest ends on January 1st. So save no action by the EFUD commissioners at their meeting on Wednesday. Uh, the ICE Center will owe almost $2,600 a month to EFUD for that debt. They're already paying their, their debt uh, to, to the local bank, and they, they're continuing to pay it. But I know, even though I haven't examined their books, I know they don't have $2,600 a month in excess revenue now to pay that loan. So if those folks go away, there's two things or three things that could happen. The bank and the EFUD would talk about what's next. Maybe it gets sold and it's used as a warehouse or some other use that's not a nice center. That's a community-based recreational facility. Maybe it could be sold to a for-profit entity to run the ICE Center that is looking to, you know, target as its customer base, high-end, you know, hockey clubs and organizations that are trying to get uh, kids into playing, you know, junior professional hockey, and, you know, high-end, uh, and, and I don't remember the name of them, but they were up in Stowe a number of years ago. Uh, if that happened, it, you know, we could probably get that buyer to pay off the debt to the EFUD and to the bank and could have the facility, but then it's not a community-based facility any longer. It's not doing what the people that founded it want to do. So in case the EFUD, I mean, in case the ICE Center Board of Directors gets to the point saying, we just can't do this anymore, we need to sell it, the town doesn't want to take it over, as long as we've restructured that note, then whoever buys it is going to have to at least negotiate with the community and, and I would hope pay that $530,000 back to us. But uh, if you want the ICE Center to remain as is a facility that, that provides huge benefits to this community without really costing the community anything, I think you need to do what I need to do, uh, what I've recommended to do. I'm going to stop there. I know that I've put a lot on the plate. I know you can probably give me a hundred reasons not to do what I suggested you do. I can only give you one reason to do it, and that is I think it's the right thing to do for the benefit of this community. So there's a lot there. If you want to talk about it now, we can do that. Um, if you want to just let it go, 
and, and come back to that as we go through, uh, you know, our next meetings and budgets. Uh, that's fine too. Um, I appreciate you listening, and I hope I haven't offended anyone with my recommendations. Um, but there they are. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make um, just one comment on behalf of EFA there. I'd like to thank Bill for his uh, forward-thinking recommendations. I think he's always given us good guidance, and I think um, these recommendations are the result of his 34 years of experience here in Waterbury. And uh, I, for one, think they are the things that we need to consider to make a stronger Waterbury, and I would look forward to working on them with the select board to uh, implement them and things for the uh, future of Waterbury. So thank you, Bill. Has this, um, so there's a couple things I think we got to kind of unpack, and this is a lot, I think, for yeah. obviously a <laughs> single meeting. Um, has the discussion with EFA been had already about the idea of the merger? Let's separate that from this idea of uh, forgiveness, because I think no. Okay, so this is this is the beginning of that conversation, right? Okay. Um, I mean, it, it that that word has been tossed about from time sure. to time. Um, the the village's preference when when the village dissolved would have been merger. We tried that at least six different times in, in the time that I've been here. Um, and it, it, it failed, and it always failed over the police department. And ultimately, when the village gave up the police department and just said, we don't want to have any more general government responsibility, uh, to do that quickly and efficiently, the dissolution of the village had to happen. And because the village had some of these other um, assets, the UDAG fund, the community development loan fund, things that weren't part of the uh, water and sewer system, including some of the land that we talked about, the dissolution of the village and creating EFUD in its current configuration was the quickest and most efficient thing to do. Um, but no, they haven't talked about it. Um, I'm not trying to put anybody out of a job, commissioners, but um, for me, the person who sits here, uh, we still have way too many boards than we really need in this community. And from my perspective, a merger at this point would be, I think, almost painless and I think also very um, uh, Transformational, and the, the reason I say that is that the main uh, the main responsibility that EFUD has is to operate its water and sewer systems. Um, the entire political boundaries of EFUD are already served by water and sewer. The only places that there's any place to grow to develop. Uh, are outside of the political boundaries of EFUD. They've spent a lot of money over the past two or three years on engineering studies. Uh, one is to you know, upgrade the water line up on Route 100 that goes from Howard Avenue down past where Sunflower uh, Natural Foods is or whatever. Um, there's a one-inch water main there that serves those Places There's no fire protection there. Um, there's the opportunity to expand the water system greatly there. George Pierce has got some significant expansion plans for Ivy Computer, where the, where the uh, summer theater area used to be. Uh, in fact, um, as an aside, I got a, a, an email from Jamie Stewart of Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation wondering if we would submit a, um, a letter of um, support for one of these veggie grants that ID Computer is trying to get because they'd like to grow a little bit faster than they are organically now, but I don't have that letter tonight uh, and 
And, but, but why should EFOD be making decisions about are we going to expand the water system out in the town? That should be the town, uh, the town's planning commission, the town's select board. Do we want to grow? How do we want to grow? Where do we want to grow? Same with Route 2, you know. Um, there's water that's been extended down Paro's gun shop, I think, maybe. I know water's available there. On the other side of the road where Sun Common is, there's water available there. I believe they're customers. We've extended the water main there. That area could be, uh, the sewer system could be expanded there to allow some more dense development to happen in a place that has, uh, you know, uh, uh, the topography that could handle some development. So, um, Moortown, um, the Moortown Planning Commission has reached out to EFI, which has the ability through its charter to sell water extraterritorially. We already have the, water, the uh, Moortown Duxbury Fire District number one, 100 customers on the other side of uh, the river. They have their own uh, water system, but they get served by EFUD. EFUD actually does their billing for them and does the maintenance of their system for them. They're looking for um, potentially some sewage to be put over there so that they can develop economic development, get some more dense development there. We've got a wastewater treatment plant here that has the capability of handling 510,000 gallons a day. And since the flood, we're barely 260,000 gallons a day. There's capacity available, but not in, not in the village because there's no room left in the village. It needs to be outside of the political entity of EFUD. So should elected officials from EFUD be the ones that are making these decisions, or should that be better a, a town responsibility? That's how I feel about it. Um, we're not going to solve that tonight. We're not going to decide whether we're going to move forward to that tonight. But I think it makes sense to at least talk about it. Um, I have so many questions. I don't want <laughs> Well, one last thing, Mike. Right? <laughs> the, the other thing, I think, and don't, don't get lost, don't lose sight of the fact that I've suggested that for the investment of $600,000 of federal ARPA money to give to EFUD so that they can deal with that um, mobile home park and get a good water system in there, that EFUD would transfer to the town its revolving loan funds. And, you know, the Bluestone building where the restaurant was, they just sold that building. There was a $108,000 loan to the, to the Bluestone. That loan was paid off today. So the balance sheet that I showed you uh, for, for the uh, UDAG fund, if you had looked at it last week, um, you know, the, the, the fund balance is the same, $1.7 million, but about 1.2, 1.3 had been all loaned out, and there was you know, uh, less money available. Now that loan is repaid, so um, of the $1.7 million of assets, only about $1.1 million is loaned out. If the town wants to think about doing work for housing, you know, <clears throat> we lent money from our CDBG fund into the Lad Hall project. The village lent money to the Lad Hall project. We've lent money, the village, into the Stimson Graves building. The town lent money to the seminary building. We've contacted um, Down Street. You were invited last year, Mark, and I think you actually went on the tour uh, through the community. We'd love to have uh, some investment. The state is starting to try to push uh, affordable housing. And the only way you're going to make affordable housing nowadays is going to be with multifamily units. You're not going to make affordable single family houses out there. So getting the town to be in control of the revolving loan fund allows that money to be talked about and planned for uses by the entire town and it can be used in the entire town as opposed to how EFI has used it. So there's a lot of opportunity here for everyone. And 
I know I've taken up too, too much of your time now, but um, if you've got questions that are burning, ask them tonight. But um, there's, this isn't going to be resolved tonight. It's a, it's a long process until we get there. Anybody? Go ahead, Mike. I agree with a lot of your premises, Bill. Um, I've always been for simplification of our governmental entities. I think sometimes we have way too many decision makers and it creates paralysis. I don't want to take jobs away from anyone, but I think sometimes streamlining things is, is a good thing. As I think Mark says, there's a lot of to compartmentalize here, you know. We're not, definitely not going to make a decision. No. One thing I do want to hear from, I would like to have the board of the ICE Center come in here and we should have a conversation about. I yeah. think some of, the, some of the proposals that you make are very reasonable. Um, I think the ICE Center has been good stewards o over the year. It is an asset. And do we want it to become you know, I know I was involved in my former job with uh, the North American uh, Hockey Academy up in Stowe, and you look, that's no longer there. Right. Uh, right. I don't know how a hockey academy, it, it may work on a very short term, but I don't know if it's, it, it, it's, it's a solution. Yeah, and, well, I'm hoping that it's not a solution. I think having a community-based Right. recreation facility that has a mission to provide recreation opportunities through ice skating and hockey to the local right. communities is is what they wanted when they when they started this process 25 years ago and that's what they've been able to deliver um, if it wasn't for the pandemic you know I, I wish I could turn the clock back on the ice center because None of us, and when I say none of us, I mean the select boards that were in place back in the early 2000s and the village trustees and even the water sewer commissioners never really looked at it as this is somebody, this is a group of people from our community trying to make an investment in our community for our community. And I feel sad that in the early days, many of the things that I said and recommended really put hurdles up for them. It made it much more difficult than it needed to be, but they persevered. And as I said, they never missed a payment on anything that they've ever owed the, the town or, or village uh, right. when they were property, properly built. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, you know, probably wouldn't be sitting here making these recommendations, but it doesn't mean that it still wouldn't have been the right thing to do because I think that they need, the more cooperation that they get from us, the, the longer and the better they'll be able to continue their mission and not burden the community with, with it. And I don't want to be in a situation like Stowe is in where you know they took over uh, they rebuilt the Jackson Arena, they made it a year-round facility. Oh, it's going to pay for itself. The Stowe taxpayers are pouring a lot of money into that facility. I don't want to see that happen here. And I think there's ways to do this that won't cost the taxpayer anything except some of their federal tax dollars. And Congress has already decided to spend that, and they've already sent most of it out to us. So we've got it in our hot little hands right now, and we should use it wisely. And I think before we start thinking about all kinds of other things we could use it for, we should stabilize that facility and make sure that it continues to exist and is not a burden on the community going forward. But I do agree with your second premise, I, is not having it totally forgiven to having it forgiven with, say, a 20-year term because of things drastically. Yeah. What's probably going to do, I think, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Right, and, and, and I don't, I don't want to forgive that debt. And then, not that I believe the ICE Center folks would plan to do this, but let's say in three years they just said, you know, we don't, we don't have enough volunteers coming in to help us. We've yeah. been doing this for 25 years. 
we're going to sell it. And then somebody buys it, and, and we're out that half a million right. dollars. So I'd like to keep the half a million dollars I, on the books. Right. I think we're at the point where I think this is a big conversation. I'm wondering if we need to, yeah, I'm, I don't know if it's a special meeting or what we need to do here. We're, we're going to um, have to. I mean, I think I expected with how things played out that there would be a conversation about EFUD merger with the town at some point. I think. I think there was a lot of reasons even prior to the pandemic that it, it made sense, but there were assets and conversations surrounding the assets of EFUD and how that would work. Um, I think a lot of things have changed since even obviously two years ago. Um, I don't even know if we should go out to the rest of the, the board with questions. I think that if we take all of this back and start to unwrap it ourselves and have meetings with you and then I, I this seems like it's to the point of maybe a special meeting i don't know if you yeah. are meeting this week will discuss this i'm assuming it would at this point they, they um, have a meeting this week and and none of the the e flight commissioners did have no heads up okay. any more than you had okay. to this so um, i think that's important to know where e stands on this because if e says we're not right. interested, and right. we're, we're, you know, as a, as a select board, we're wasting our time. I know this is a merger meeting. I don't want to put you put on the spot. I'm not a merger meeting, I'm a joint meeting. Um, I don't want to put you put on the spot to have to discuss this in this joint meeting. Um, but I think there's a lot that probably does make sense here. But I, I fear that it's 8:30. Yeah, um, we're already behind on our agenda items. Is there anyone who has questions on this? before we move on i don't really don't mean to like rush this part of it but i'm trying to respect everybody's yeah, time i think it's time uh, to okay. move on. Yeah. and um, i would just say thank you for being very thorough it's also the unless they're on zoom the ice center knows nothing about this proposal either okay. so yeah, it's not going to share yeah. with anybody i mean i so, think we, we can certainly come up with this again at another meeting and sure. more end up to the week into the weeds on it. Yeah, we, we're going to have to get it ironed out. Yeah, like, I, I don't even know how to start discussing the forgiveness of debt that isn't our debt right now. It's me like debt, and I don't even know how to like right. even appropriately speak to that. Yeah. Um, okay. um, if everyone's okay, we're going. I'm going to move the agenda forward. Um, update on status of search for zoning admin. Yes. So. Um, we were hoping to have an interview with the next candidate for the zoning administrator tonight. Um, the planning commission, uh, after the gentleman that that was uh, appointed by the select board back in uh, early October, he resigned uh, after a week and a half. Uh, we re-advertised. Uh, the planning commission uh, interviewed a couple of candidates and nominated a candidate uh, at their last meeting last week. And the expectation of staff was that that person would be here tonight to interview with the select board. Um, Steve Lotspeech and I met with him, however, uh, last week to just talk about some of the administrative and ministerial duties. And um, although we had advertised for a range of $21 to $29 an hour. Um, the expectation of staff, me in particular, was that we weren't going to be hiring anybody at the top of the range uh, unless it was, um, you know, really a uh, once in a lifetime candidate. Uh, the person was well qualified, uh, is not educated as a planner, but as a geographer, but has worked as a planner and a zoning administrator for, for about 20 years, I think, and looked like it was going to be a good match. Uh, I talked to you a little bit at the last meeting and, and in email since the last meeting about the difficulty in the labor market and what wages are doing. Uh, anyway, I said, this is likely what we're going to offer you. I can't put an offer in writing until the select board actually points you, because this is the only position that I don't get to appoint as a town manager. Um, when I presented him 
or orally with, uh, with the compensation package, he said, well, I need $29 an hour firm, no negotiation. That's what I have to have. I said, well, kind of don't give us much wiggle room to even talk if that's your attitude. I said, I'll see what I can do. Um, he and Steve went in the other room and talked, and that night he sent an email saying, it's clear that you're not willing to pay what this job demands. Uh, I'm withdrawing from consideration. So we're back to the drawing board again, and Steve is continuing to try to do both his job and his own administrator's job. Um, you know, I, I'm disappointed in that. Uh, during the interview, even before the person kind of presented his ultimatum, I, I was a little bit, um, he was a, a very strong-willed, kind of driven personality, and I'm not sure would have been the best fit anyway, but even so, uh, I'm just letting you know that finding people, and I, you know, Dina uh, had been the zoning administrator here for four or five years, and uh, although we tweaked the job description to give this new position a little bit more responsibility to do some of the planning work, um, you know, she was being paid, you know, barely $21 an hour, and to go 29 immediately just doesn't seem like uh, it's in the cards, at least for me. So that's it. And I, I want, I put this in this spot on the agenda just so the E5 commissioners could hear it as well, because there's likely to be uh, some um, uh, turnover in uh, water and sewer staff over the next year or so. And I'm just kind of letting you all know that it's just a very difficult labor market now. It is an employee's market, and uh, that's a challenge. I so. have a question. Do, um, do you know, have you worked on, I know that you have worked on this, but I'm curious to know a little bit more of the compensation um, comparison for similar jobs. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have the VLCP. So big range. I've got the VLCP salary survey. Mm -hmm. um, that just was published in, it, you know, it just came to us in uh, in hard copy form uh, a month and a half ago. So it's information that was probably compiled and finalized, I would say, in June, um, before the real kind of uh, steep slope up in the inflation rate and in, uh, in pressures on wages. The range that we had was quite wide because we are trying, and as Mark put it, you know, if we could hire somebody who might be able to mm -hmm. step up into the planner's commission, into the planner's position, when the time comes for Steve to retire, it would be nice to have that flexibility. So it's a, it's a little bit different job description than the pure zoning administrator that we had before. but. Uh, I was not in a position that day to promise the guy that um, and I said, well, see what I can do. And if you came and interviewed and, you know, kind of blew your socks off, and if you had said, sure, we'll pay him what he wants, that's one thing. But he didn't allow the opportunity for that. When, when I said, boy, that's going to be kind of tough, uh, he just decided, see you later. Okay, so we're back to 13. Yep. Okay. Well, there's a growing mentality throughout this country that's become, in my opinion, worse than the virus itself. That, uh, and for several reasons, and I won't get into what I think those reasons are, but people believe that they're worth way more than they're probably really worth in, in, in the, uh, the working world these days. So, yeah, this, is, this type of thing is rampant everywhere. Um, I'm sure the business owners in this building tonight that can uh, attest to that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I stopped at the I stopped at the uh, uh, Irving store in Stowe yesterday on my way to uh, to Canaan, and I had to get gas, and I went inside and bought a couple of donuts, and there's a sign on the door for you know just cash register attendance, fifteen dollars an hour. 
$14 an hour if you want to stand behind the Dunkin' Donuts counter. And, you know, we've been hiring people to work on, you know, our highway crews and stuff like that within the past couple of years at, you know, $17 or $18 an hour. And it's, it's a tough deal. And I'm not disagreeing with you, Chris. It's just that's where we are. And if we're going to mention that, it's also important to remember that cost of living is really yeah, high. Yeah, it is. And it as is. someone who has multiple jobs, full-time yeah, jobs I'm, and side jobs, it's hard to pay that. I'm, so, I'm not, not suggesting yeah, that yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. worth it. I just, just want to remember that. that. There's Both pressures. There's I'm pressures. not disagreeing with you. Oh, yeah. Yet, but so, to your point, outside of this municipality, the government have overspent and undervalued. We haven't got the return on investment. Don't have for our time money, for this conversation. and has driven up the cost of living for most people to the point where they're just they can't keep up anymore. So it's you know right. it's a it's a bigger discussion than we have planned for. I think we can right now. We'd like to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other business for the joint session while we're all here together? Yes. Okay. Can you? Not going to want to hear this either, but <laughs> <laughs> um, at the end of 2022, I will be huh. stepping down as town manager. Um, in March next year, I will have been here in Waterbury as municipal manager for 34 years. I started my career in Island Pond. Um, 40 years ago, next October. And um, I've loved almost every minute of my job here. There's a few seconds in there every once in a while that I can think of where I didn't have a good time. Um, but uh, this has been a tremendous opportunity for me. I feel honored to have served here, this community, for this length of time. It's been a wonderful community to live in. I continue, I will plan to continue living here. I'm, I'm not planning to go anywhere. Um, but since the flood in particular, uh, there's just been, you know, it's been pedal to the metal for me for a long time. And uh, I've got grandkids now that I want to spend a little time with. I've got an elderly mother who my sister and brother are taking care of in Massachusetts that I need to spend a little bit more time there. My, my wife has a, an elderly father in the same situation. Um, and although there are uh, many challenges and opportunities for professional satisfaction ahead, and I think I laid a lot of those out uh, in the first hour of this meeting, uh, I think that's always going to be the case. And if I wait until I think that there's nothing left for me to be able to do, it's never going to come. So with a reluctant heart uh, and with a head that has had lots of conversations with my wife, um, I think that the time has come. Uh, I would recommend that um, probably the boards contact uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, allow them to help you with the recruitment process. Um, if I were you, I think a reasonable goal would be to have somebody uh, hired and able to come on board sometime maybe November next year. Um, I will be happy to work through the end of the year with whomever that person is. And if the town and EFUD, if it still exists, I'm hoping that maybe it will be on its way to being out of business. But uh, if the town and EFUD uh, want to continue some uh, relationship with me and the ability to uh, use whatever skills you think I may have, that's something that I'll always be willing to talk about with you. But for now, I think um, the time has come for me to let you know that. Um, I'm sorry to have to tell you that because if I, I know it's a, 
it's a big challenge. The final thing I would say, and again, this is something that you all have to decide on yourself, and the voters have, uh, have a, a big say in this as well, but I would recommend to all of you, if at all possible, even those of you who have terms expiring in March, that maybe you ought to run for another term and if you have to resign somewhere down the road. But um, asking new board members to come on uh, with no experience about how this municipality runs and operates and what's important, and then have that person have to be involved in the hiring of a new town manager would be somewhat difficult, I think. So I would encourage all of you to, to consider running again for a term if your terms are ending. And I know, you know there's at least probably three people on, on both boards that have terms that expire every year. Uh, but if you can re-up for at least another year or so, that would probably be best for the community. Um, not sure it'll be best for you, but for the community, it probably will be best. So anyway, with that, I'm going to put my mask on and shut up. I was going to say, I guess it's time for me to put a for sale sign up, because if we can't even hire a uh, zoning administrator, oh. God help us with a town manager. Last year. <laughs> but it's well-deserved, Bill. Uh. That's sad. Sorry to see you go, Bill, but... Well, I'm not going anywhere yet. The whole year. Well, thank you for giving us that notice. I think that obviously helps us realize the time and the crunch we're going to have to find a replacement, so I appreciate the time you're giving us to do that. Um, are there... Any other, is there any other joint business um, before we let the EFUD folks go? I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Um, I understand that you had put a prescription against applause during this meeting, but considering Bill's long service to the town, can you give a round of applause for sure. the long <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great idea. Um, I don't know. Yeah, Hearing no other business, I was going to entertain a motion to adjourn the uh, equipment commissioner's meeting at this time. Okay. Go watch Monday Night Football. <laughs> <laughs> I think your power's out. If I can. <laughs> Second that motion. I'll make the motion. Anyway. Second it. Motion made and seconded to adjourn the uh, equipment. Uh, joint portion of the meeting. All those in favor say, let's go. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank Obviously, you. I'm thank you, discuss, and, uh, so thank you for, for coming in tonight. We look forward to working with you on uh, Bill's uh, suggestions. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Have a good night. Thanks, Skip. See you, Skip. See you, Natalie. All right, moving on. Select board business. I know everyone. How many people are here for item A and how many are for B? And I, I can, we can move it if we want to just, I know there's a lot of people that hope to speak. It's already 8.30. I don't know what item A and B is. Um, item A is consider the graphics for an anti-racism inclusion banner that we voted forward. It's a discussion of graphics. I don't know, do we have it? Yeah. Okay. I guess we just do it real quick. So this was a banner that we moved forward uh, two meetings ago, maybe, uh, maybe three, um, and now this is just the graphic. So it's this is exactly the wording that was voted forward. Do any of the select board members have a comment on it? Yes. Um, I don't know. If the last version I saw had um, words in the background, and we can all see it. Is this one clear of those? Yes, that's okay. exactly what you said. Okay, and then was there a reason that the colors green and yellow were used instead of the, <coughs> the library colors of the orange and the white? I am uncertain who chose those colors. Okay. Um, Good question. It's kind of a pounding in the face. I, yeah, in, in my opinion, the yeah. colors that we use for most of our banners in Waterbury are softer. Okay. So. 
Can I ask you a question? Hold, hold on. Uh, let me just go around with the select board, and then I'll be happy to open it to the public if that's okay. I concur with what Kenny just said. Yeah, I, I haven't seen this yet either. I, um, do we ha we don't have a color book for Waterbury, so I, mean, I think we do have a. Uh, we do have a. a I don't know what it's called, a brand. Yes. Yeah. With colors. Okay. So do we want to? Which is typically this white and orange, and I don't know what else. Yeah. So, Kate, did you request to just change the color? Yeah. The colors of yellow and green. Yeah. Move it to the white and orange. Yes. Yeah. Or just white? Or just all white? Um. I mean, if I may, can you take this how you, how you want to, but the, the first look at that, it felt accusatory. Yeah. I'm sorry to say that, but. I, I don't think we should go down like the route of discussing the wording. No, that's what I'm saying the color scheme just, that's the first thing that hit me is like, holy cow. Uh, you know, if we can use something more neutral. This is a select board meeting. We are discussing. If we can use something more neutral that uh, kind of allows you to read the words as a whole instead of bam. And possibly the same font as Vermont Origin. Yeah, I know that there is a, I think we should make a decision tonight on what it looks like. I don't want to go too down the road of extending that to the next meeting around font right. or color. Um, so if the words on the right match the Vermont font, mm -hmm. and then um, would you want all the, everything white without, except for Vermont, or Waterbury and orange? Or is everything in white? I mean, how would a blue look? Well, if we're saying we're going to change the way you damage racism and welcomes all town colors. colors, I don't know offhand what the town color scheme is, but I can have Nathan Carlos Let me see if it, I think it was on the call. I think if whatever the town color is, is that what should be the call? I think Nick's on the call, but I'm not sure. He was, but I, he may have lost power too. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we could just say whatever was that voted for. I can't remember when that was in terms of like the. I remember that was like a consult outside consultant years ago, gave us some kind of color scheme and font. Laura Pratt. Yeah. I could. I know Nick's working on this, so maybe he could regroup with Laura. Okay. She's a graphic designer. Sure. Um, okay. I'm just trying to think how we can move forward in some kind of motion. We've already made a motion to approve the banner. This is just the look of the banner. I can't imagine we need to make a motion again to approve the law. We'll just ask for the, the, we'll just ask for the changes. Yeah. I think it's just going way overboard to think that we need to vote for anything else. I think if Nick works with Laura, she'll come up, they'll come up with good right. So if the, if the question is we're looking for board feedback on the look, I think the board feedback sounds well, like it is. Fine. Make sure that it falls into whatever the look, book, and color scheme of whatever Waterbury is supposed to be using for this. Well, do we do we dare to just leave it at that and expect that it's going to be? Can it, can it be shown to us? Yeah, I I would say I, I'll make a motion to approve the design as is, with a modification that it meet the the colors match the towns. Yeah, I don't think they're in the and that's, and that's as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I personally don't think we need a motion. I think that the, we give the feedback. We've already approved the banner. So I think we just give the feedback that we expected to have the color and font choices that match whatever mm -hmm. has been approved for the town. Right. Branding. Yep. Branding. I think the there. Waterbury, Vermont part is is uh, typical. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just would request that the rest of it be all either the same color, uh, using town colors. Fine. Yeah. I think that's fine. And all we're doing is giving that feedback, and then I think we. I can talk. I can touch base with you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are moving on to the discussion of the local mask mandate. Um, as everyone knows, uh, or most people might know that the governor 
previous to the governor's decision, or I'm not sure if it's a motion or whatever that is considered, um, towns were not allowed to enact any kind of mask mandate because there wasn't a state of emergency. And anyone can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so now they have authorized towns to be able to um, put forward local mask mandates. That's the discussion that we're having tonight. Um, we received a copy of what the local mask mandate might look like, which I think came from the Vermont League of City and, and Towns Bill. Yes. Resolution. Yeah. Yep. And so basically what the governor is allowing is towns to enact local mask mandates that are active for, I think, no more than 30 days without renewal. Um, this is a in response to towns requesting that they be allowed to do this, which previously they were not allowed to. Um, this is a sample that was, uh, was this from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns or? Um, Vermont League of Cities and Towns offered kind of a template. Uh, the town of Stowe, but they're discussing this tonight. Um, and then I amended this from that. So it's not exactly the same as the Stowe's. I think it reads a little bit better. Um, I don't know if any, everyone can read this. I'm happy to read it out loud. Yeah. Um, so it says, whereas Governor Scott has signed into law S1 authorizing the legislative body of the municipality to adopt a temporary rule requiring individuals to wear face coverings while indoors and in locations open to the public. Whereas a high rate of community transmission of COVID-19 is occurring across the entire state of Vermont, and whereas the Waterbury Select Board recognizes that COVID-19 remains a public health hazard in Waterbury and in surrounding communities, and believes wearing a face covering by the general public while indoor space is an important means of reducing spread of COVID-19. Now, therefore, be it resolved, all public and private establishments located in the town of Waterbury, open to the public, shall require staff, customers, and visitors to wear a face covering or a face shield over their noses and mouths while inside the establishment within six feet of others. Face coverings or face shields shall not be required for children under the age of two, persons with a disability which prevents safe use of a face covering or a face shield, a person for whom a face covering or face shield would create a risk to workplace health and safety, a person who is physically exerting themselves during work or athletic endeavor, and persons eating and drinking inside any establishment that serves food or beverages. Each establishment is individually responsible to post signage at the entrance to the premises and at other appropriate locations stating staff, customers, and visitors are required to wear face coverings or face shields. This resolution shall take effect immediately and shall remain in effect until the select board amends, rescinds, or suspends this rule by action at properly warned meeting or if the board fails to extend the resolution as prescribed by law, which I stated earlier was the 30 days. The resolution shall be nullified when the authority granted by the state through the law expires or if the law is repealed by the state. So that is what we're discussing this evening. Yeah, so this, this again was copied from Bill, or modified from. Yeah, this is what I, what I took was what the town of Stowe was going to be considering tonight, and then just changed a few words to make it, you know, they had customers and then they had visitors in parenthesis, and I think that, you know, you want for staff, customers, and visitors. So it's essentially, I, it's not something that I wrote out of whole cloth. I, you know, took a template that has been uh, provided by the LCT and, and it's fine tuned by one municipality, and I fine tuned it further. That's all. With that being said, I am a business owner in town that has a food and eating and drinking establishment, so I am going to recuse myself but happily speak on behalf of my business and my restaurant. <coughs> but I'm going to be handing the meeting over to you, and Just I will lovely. take my place <laughs> in the public. And I Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Chris, do you mind if I... I owe you one. <laughs> Chris, before we go public, do you mind if I say I'm very short? 
Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think I just want to clarify that this isn't a motion, like um, something that us as a board created and are offering up. As a group, we haven't talked about this or considered it. It's because it was um, created the law by the governor and then we were asked to discuss it at the meeting. So it's not that we as a body are proposing this mandate. We're here to discuss it and talk about whether we think it makes the most sense for the town. And I just wanted to clarify that in case that affects how you want to speak or talk tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Good point. So, Danny, is this just considered a discussion then yeah. and not that this isn't a public hearing as to whether or not this would happen? Right. I mean, we, uh, in theory, cannot vote and put it off, I think, or we can vote. Uh, the, the, um, yeah. the, the, public, the public does not, the, the public certainly has the right to <clears throat> make their voices known to the select board members either here at this meeting or, you know, call them, email them, what have you. Uh, as Danny said, uh, some board members asked for this to be on the agenda given what the legislature has approved. And rather than sit here for an evening and talk about whether we want to do anything or not, I thought it would be helpful to have something that actually had uh, language that could be adopted if the board wants to do it. Uh, the public does not get a vote on this. This is not a town meeting. Um, this is not a proposed ordinance. Um, uh, this is the select board has some very narrow authority granted to it by the legislature to address this issue and can make this particular rule. There are some communities who have I believe put it into ordinance form. The city of Burlington, I believe, is is adopting it as an ordinance and is even proposing fines. But uh, that's not something that's being proposed here. Um, I'm just the messenger. I'm just trying to get something for the board to be able to discuss. So the two paths are no action, and we just move on as is, or we vote to adopt this policy. Right. 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 Or, or you can say, well, we want to adopt something, but, but it's it. not this, right. and you amend it, and you either do that tonight or at a future meeting. So with that being said, I want to set some guidelines here for speaking. Um, as you know, we've had a change on, on the time frame to two minutes. Um, first, I'd like to know from either Danny or somebody who's a computer buff, <laughs> Uh, a question was asked to me earlier about um, how people on Zoom uh, would chime in on this. Uh, they can raise a hand. Okay. Right. So like a, it's difficult to have eyes on both sides of your head. I'll, I'll so, uh, Chris, we, we should probably alternate between someone in the air yeah. and someone on the Yeah, screen. good suggestion. Uh, and you'll have two minutes. Uh, I know it's difficult to stick two minutes. Stick to two minutes, and uh, we'll certainly. Uh, understand if you know as long as you keep it within a few seconds after that we'll we'll, we'll let you finish up but uh i don't know who would like to start i'd, I'd probably like to maybe if we could have people queue up on them yeah let's uh okay so i see the first three here so i'd like gary dillon to speak first and then we'll go to somebody on zoom i have the order and, and then back uh okay do, do you want me to come up there yeah i would like you yes, to if you would yeah I don't think I'll take two minutes. <laughs> I, I think the, if Waterbury wanted to do something, they could put out a recommendation saying we encourage people to wear masks. Mandating it, certainly, as this is laid out, makes absolutely no sense. You're saying to people, you can go into a restaurant, sit with a bunch of people. You can go into a bar, sit with a bunch of people. But you can't walk past somebody in a store without wearing a mask. That makes absolutely no sense to me. None. You know, it, this, the science it really just depends on who you listen to. And for those people that are not vaccinated, the governor's been right, right along. For those that are not vaccinated, they're on the fence whether or not they should or should not get vaccinated. To now say you have to wear a mask, they're gonna say, what's the point of getting vaccinated? I've said the same thing. I've been vaccinated, I've had a booster shot, and now you're saying, sorry, you still have to wear a mask unless you go into a restaurant or a bar and sit next to a bunch of people. 
this makes absolutely no sense. And I'll yield my <laughs> 45 seconds to somebody else. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Carol. Okay, uh, Carol, your turn. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Your last name, please. Oh, right. Carol McNair, M C N A I R. Ready? Are you a resident of Waterbury? I am, Waterbury Center. Thanks. Um, so, we have to get COVID under control to protect our most vulnerable people, which includes our children. And I'm a teacher. And I've had firsthand experience about how COVID is currently affecting our children and their learning. Students are missing school because they're close contacts and needing to quarantine or they've tested positive for COVID. And usually it's been one to two weeks of school that's being missed for children. And unlike last year, we had some online options for kids um, we don't have those in place this year. And so kids who are at home are often alone, they feel lost, they feel isolated and often scared. If they have parents who are working, they are all alone. And I think that what we need to remember is that last year we wore masks. And last year I had no students in my class having to quarantine or be home because of COVID. And as soon as we stopped wearing masks, our cases have risen um, incredibly high. And I feel like we all know that kids have to be in school. It's for their mental wellness, it's for their learning. And that I feel like as adults that we just have to step up, put a piece of fabric over our mouths when we're in public places that we often don't have choices to go to like the grocery store. Um, for the greater good of our children and their emotional needs. And um, just to comment on um, the last um, speaker, um, I think going to a restaurant or a bar is a choice and people can choose not to go there if that doesn't make them feel comfortable, but people have to go to the grocery store. And when they go to those places, um, they should be able to feel safe. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody keeping this civil. It's an important role model for our children. Thank you, Carol. Okay, Elizabeth, I think you were next. Then the gentleman, we'll go back to the Zoom and then the gentleman in front of you after that. No microphone. <laughs> I have a feeling y'all aren't any more thrilled to be here than we are. You've been put in an unnecessary position, one you never should have been put into. The governor knew that this was a hot potato and he was happy to pass it on. Our legislators did the same. They didn't want to deal with the headaches they knew would be the result of mandating masks, especially after assuring all Vermonters that getting vaccinated would eliminate the need for masks and get us back to normal but they are really good at moving the goalposts, aren't they? So the hot potato is now in your hands. My hope is that you will understand the added burden the mask mandate will place on the business owners of our town. It's one thing to recommend that people wear a mask. Anyone who wants to, needs to, or should wear one, should. But forcing a business owner into the position of having to play the bad guy as it relates to both their employees and their customers is honestly just adding salt to an already very deep wound. Our businesses have suffered enough and our citizens are weary of conflicting information and forced compliance. Allowing business owners to encourage customers to wear masks rather than forcing them to, them to do so keeps those owners from having to enforce what they know to be an at worst in, unenforceable and at best difficult to enforce mandate. Allowing business owners to encourage customers to wear masks rather than forcing them to do so also prevents them from having to play sides when there is a conflict between patrons and prevents them from possible lost revenues. A mask mandate will cause further division and animosity in our town that's already divided. And for what? Most are wearing masks of their own volition. I urge you to respect both the intelligence and the rights of the citizens of Waterbury the business owners and other Vermonters who enjoy bringing their business to Waterbury. Please do not pass on this, or please do not pass on this hot potato to our business owners. Say no to mask mandates. Thanks. Thank 
Who's next on Zoom? Uh, Denver. Denver? Denver Wilson, um, your, your turn. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Denver Wilson. I'm a resident of Heinsberg. I have family in Waterbury, and I do business there. I have a bachelor's of science degree in electromechanical engineering technology. And I worked in the field of scientific research for 10 years where I was shoulder to shoulder with scientists performing behavior on pharmaceutical research. I know science. I've done a lot of independent research on this topic. And I wanna say that masks work, but only in the sense that they do stop a portion of aerosols that we inhale or exhale. How much? I can cite well-designed studies that show an N95 stopped about 40% of exhaled aerosols. Cloth or surgical masks were about 10%. You may say that's better than nothing. However, these peer-reviewed published articles also showed that considerable concentrations of aerosols accumulated in poorly ventilated spaces, probably like the one you're all in right now, regardless of mask use, period. That means if you're in a room with someone who's infected with COVID, the mask is not going to prevent you from being infected. You'll be exposed. This supports why mask mandates are not associated with low, slower infection rates. I urge the board to take a cue from Heinsberg, Rutland, Morrisville, Stowe, and note that regardless of the effectiveness of masks, people are already masking. The mandate is unnecessary. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Denver. Okay, if you can come up and just state yes. your name and where you're from. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Wool. I'm a resident of Barry City. I'm here tonight because I've spent money in this community. I mean, Vermont's rural, so you have different places in your little cities. I've dined here, I've spent money here. Um, I was a former Mass EMT, worked at Lawrence General as well. Um, my thing is, the select board member said nobody brought this forward, it was just a discussion, and that's what it was warned as. But your town administrator just said that several board members wanted him to bring that. There's also a misconception of, uh, I was at the state house that day that legislature passes. You're not passing a rule or a uh, uh, policy. You are passing an ordinance. You better read what the state told you that you're gonna pass. It is gonna be a legal ordinance, okay? So just to clarify those <laughs> misconceptions. The thing is, I'm not anti-mask, and I read the Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, like that other speaker said, the efficacy or whatever. It can't stop influenza, it ain't stopping this. You took your mask off for an hour and a half, you have your note. Again, hypocrisy, this protocol. At hospitals, we don't wear masks all day long. You have little kids wearing these cloth masks, it's ridiculous. It's a virtue signaling thing. If you really wanted to follow science, this correct procedure. My thing is business. We have freedoms in this country. Businesses can put up a sign. It's their patrons. I don't like when government is getting involved in this. It's a slippery slope. And again, you are passing a law, not a rule, not anything. Who's gonna enforce it? Again, everybody's passing the buck, and now you're gonna have people that might have interactions with your business. This is causing, and again, we're so far into the game. Barry City passed on this, okay? And the mayor and the council were clear. People want to wear masks, they wear masks. Businesses have the right to put up a sign, and if you don't, they can have you trespassed. We already have laws for this. And again, you, it's getting more division. And again, if you are going to impose a mask, you better cite the data of the efficacy, and you better cite the negative <laughs> from breathing a wet, moist you know, rag in your face. That's all. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your comments. Yeah. Chris. Next. Yes, hold on. Second. Yeah, just to clarify, the town administrator did not say that several board members asked for this specific thing to be on here. Several board members asked for the issue to be on the agenda, so I presented something that they could have a discussion about. Nobody on the board asked for any, any wording. It was a discussion. I provided the wording to have the ability to talk about something that was real. So just to clarify and, uh, you know. Yeah, we had to, you know, if we were gonna have a conversation about it, it had to start somewhere and, and you just right. put that 
uh, pin in the, in the starting point. Did you have something to say, Danny? I know we had two folks already, so I don't know. It's up to you. Do we want to start with Waterbury residents, or do we just want to let it? Uh, well, I think, the past. I think if we can hear from several people here tonight, because business owners are not necessarily Waterbury residents, but they're a big part of Waterbury, and I think those people should be heard as well as anybody. So I believe, is it Sue who wants to speak next? Sue, go ahead. Thank you for coming. Hi, thank you all. Can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Sue Minter. I'm a resident of Waterbury Center, and I want to just thank you all for your time and dedication tonight. I, it's hard for me not to thank Bill Shuplick for his incredible service, and I also appreciate, as one of those people 25 years ago that helped um, uh, as a planning commissioner with the road and the uh, ice center, I appreciate those comments. But I'm here tonight really to just express my strong support for requiring masking in public spaces. I haven't read the details of the ordinance you're considering, but I want to emphasize that from where I sit, um, we are at a really serious moment in this global pandemic, and we are really, as a state, at a tipping point. Because what we do now, as individuals and a community, is going to affect the future course of this virus. And the more opportunities we give the virus to spread, the more people it will infect, and the more mutations that will evolve, and the higher risks will likely occur. So that is exactly what is happening right now in Vermont. The virus is infecting more people, and more people, especially the majority of whom are unvaccinated, are becoming critically ill and even succumbing to the virus. So our question now, as individuals in a community is, what do we do? Do we watch this happen and do nothing? Or do we try new strategies? Do we learn lessons from what we have seen working in the past? I believe the goalposts of the virus are what's moving, not politicians. Because we have never been in this place before. And I personally am becoming very alarmed by what is happening. So we have to ask ourselves, what is our personal responsibility? And what are the responsibilities of you, our elected officials, the stewards of our community, and our destiny? Yeah, the, your two minutes are up, Sue. Thanks. And we did, appreciate your comments. I'll send the rest of my comments in writing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, anybody in here? That, would like to speak. This gentleman first, and then, then you, and then Gail. Um, but we'll jump back and forth. So. Select board members, thank you for your time. My name is Paul Valoran. I'm a resident of Barry Town. However, both of my parents worked in Waterbury for many years prior to the pandemic. I was a 2020 candidate for the Vermont Senate. I will be running again in 2022. I'm here before you today not to talk about the efficacy of masks that's been documented very well to be very minimal at best. The University of Waterloo has images to prove the lack of efficacy. I'm here to talk to you about the human cost of wearing masks. Children have been mentioned before, so I'm going to mention them again. There have been studies at Brown's University that have proven that children born during the pandemic have seen precipitous drops in the IQ rates. And what I mean by that is the average IQ rate of a person is 100. That includes everyone in this room, that includes everyone in the United States and the world. Children born during the first half of the pandemic, that average IQ dropped to 86 in change. And the second half of the pandemic dropped to 78 in change. For those of you who are unaware, anyone who has an IQ under 85 cannot hold a majority of any real jobs. In fact, it is illegal to even join the army. This is significant damage to our children. This is unfortunate damage that we, made, we took actions that we thought were correct, come to find out we were wrong. That's why the previous mask mandate once lifted, the governor said he would never impose it again. I believe there is good science, there have been good studies to prove that the dangers of continuing to push uh, mandated masking is far more than the benefit that we might extract from it. So while I believe that everyone needs to make an educated choice, it is your decision whether or not you want to wear a mask. If a business owner wants to require it, if a property owner wants to require it, that is their right. It is not the place of any governing body to force something that, in, in theory, and actually in, there's a good argument that does more harm than good, to be pushed on the people of its towns, counties, or state. I yield my time. 
Thank you. Next up is Amy. Amy Lepsky. No, Amy. Amy. Amy, oh. Amy the other Amy. Oh, Amy, Amy Dole Oh, okay. it is. Okay. I'll be quick. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I just wanted to say quickly that mandates are burdensome and at their essence discriminatory. So Stowe, Morrisville, and Barry have already turned down voting this evening or this week mask mandates. That will drive business out of Waterbury and into those towns for people who would prefer to shop or support businesses where masks are not being mandated. Again, as it was already mentioned, a mandate does hold legal implications, whether or not you all wanna use enforcement this go around or not. And, and that is discriminatory. And to hang a banner over your town that says that racism has no place here, you can't then enforce or try to uphold mandates. I'm a, I'm a mother of BIPOC children. And I always worry about them and how they'll be perceived in the community. One of my children cannot mask. And so to think that that child could potentially face legal and or uh, other repercussions for their inability to mask is unfathomable. And my concern is mask mandates today, vax mandates tomorrow, and vaccine mandates are even more incredibly discriminatory as they disproportionately uh, negatively impact BIPOC individuals, indigenous communities and people of color. So if those are communities that you're trying to unite in Waterbury, as it seems like you are based on the first half of your meeting and some of the other things on your agenda, then I would definitely encourage you ixnay on the mass mandates. Last thing, COVID is endemic. It's here to stay. We're not gonna get rid of it. We're gonna have many mutations and Luckily, the Omicron mutation is much less virulent than the most recent variant of Delta. So it's gonna only get better as we go on. Like, and correlation and causation aren't always the same. Just because the kids were wearing masks in school last year, doesn't mean that that helped suppress COVID, right? Because here we are all vaxxed and COVID is on the rise, right? So the virus is going to run its course. There's going to be variants. We can't be living in and out and under and through mandates. Thanks, Annie. Your time's up, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, the gentleman in the rear here, and then uh, whoever will be next. Uh, so I think I think probably I might. I think the board maybe will stop comments at 20 after. That's another 15 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves. Um, so go ahead, sir. My name is Pat Farrell. I live in Waterbury. I am on the uh, DRB. Uh, so I really thank you all for you know, how difficult this is tonight. I understand that. Um, over the past several months in Waterbury, I've seen masks, no masks by folks, businesses that mandate, others that don't. I haven't seen massive outbreaks, closed businesses or residents fighting over masks. Seems to be going well. Why change it? Uh, mandating something because you can is a really slippery slope. Uh, personally, I'm tired of hearing it's just a mask. It's the least you can do to care about the community. Uh, it's not just a mask for me. When I'm forced to wear a mask, I hyperventilate, I get sweaty, I get confused. My body reacts and my blood pressure increases. I've been, I've been unable to donate blood the last two times because my pressure readings are so high while wearing a mask. Um, I had to remove my mask at the doctor's office so my blood pressure would go down so they'd let me leave. It's not ever just a mask for me. Um, and while we've gone out of our way to support as many local businesses as often as we can for the last 18 months, if this board decides to mandate masks, our household will not spend any money in Waterbury. Stowe and South Burlington have already voted this measure down, so there are places for us to spend money without going that far. Focus on education, add signage, strongly suggest, really strongly suggest, but please do not mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. Amy. Uh, Amy. Amy. Uh, let's go. What's your last yes, name? Yes, hello. Can what's you? It? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. What's your last name, Amy? Hornblast. Okay. What is it? Hornblast. Hornblast. I sent an email to the board members, so you you can find it there. Well, I, I'm not a board can member. You, can you spell it? H O R N B L A S. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Amy. It's getting hard to breathe. I can't breathe. Where did those quotes come from? They come from a study that looked at 
the physiological effects of wearing an N95 in intensive care unit nurses. In order for these nurses to participate in the study, they had to pass a fitness test. They had to make sure that no one participating in the study was um, pregnant, had arrhythmias, hypertension, poorly controlled asthma, history of panic attacks or claustrophobia, and or seizure disorder. Even still, one out of the 10 nurses dropped out after 30 minutes because she could not tolerate the mask. This study found that wearing an N95 for an entire 12 hour shift, um, in, the, the problems increased over time. CO2 levels, uh, carbon that's carbon dioxide levels became significantly elevated. Um, they had perceived exertion was increased. So it was harder for them to work perceived shortness of air and complaints of headache, lightheadedness, and difficulty communicating. This study is cited by the CDC on their worker safety website, which I also sent to the board members so that you can read what the CDC actually has to say about wearing things like N95s and dust masks. They say that an FFR N95 user is always going to experience some level of difficulty breathing. This is what the CDC says. Um, when people say that masks are safe and that there aren't side effects, they aren't citing sources. They aren't, they're going on some sort of faith-based uh, faith based science. I would say blind faith-based science. If people are not looking at the reasons behind these suggestions and are just blindly following them, that's not science. That's also not how you do public health policy. Public health policy has to weigh the benefits and risks. Um, yeah, so thank you. I would urge you to do that. There are serious negative health impacts that are very well documented that need to be considered and weighed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. What's that, Rob? I said that's a good, that's a very good reason to keep people out of the hospital and wear your mask so that you don't have people overrunning the hospital. So you just went completely opposite of what she just explained. Gail, I know. Order, Hey, people, come on. Um, Gail, you were next. Come on up. You don't have to sit. No. <laughs> Jump up and down for all we care. As long as you look into the uh, camera. <laughs> I'd rather look at the select board here. We appreciate that. <clears throat> my name is Gail Brown, and my husband and I have owned the Cold Hollow Cider Mill for 22 years. It'll be 23 in February. The last several years, the last two years, in order to survive what's been going on personally with our business and our employees through all this, I have chosen to maintain a high vibration and that has not been easy. The key element to doing that has been to live in a place of no judgment. No judgment to my employees, to my customers, to my neighbors, to fellow businessmen and women about whether they want to wear a mask or not wear a mask, whether they're in fear or they're not in fear. Waterbury is at a crossroads to so much that this state has to offer. And we have a chance here tonight to be the change that we want to be, to be the change of no judgment to others to not police our neighbors, to not finger point to someone who can't wear a mask or who doesn't want to wear a mask. I can't, I can't fathom wearing a mask the seven days a week, 70 hours a week and 90 hours a week my husband and I work in our business and be a criminal and be fined if I don't do that according to this ordinance. So I please ask you to be the change with no discrimination and judgment, to live in a high vibration and to help this community begin to move forward with a higher frequency. No judgment, no discrimination. And please vote no. I thank you. Thanks, Gail. <clears throat> Okay, uh, 
Nobody still, online. We've still got some time left. Nobody on the I, Okay, I so um, this, this, gentleman, this gentleman was first, and then Rick Blake, and then <clears throat> you two. Thank you. My name is Jim Sexton. I've been uh, very heavily involved around the state for about four years. Mostly I uh, fight for pro-life and 2A and the Constitution. The last four months I've been going around the state going to school board meetings and select board meetings. I want to thank each one of you because you've been very attentive, you've been courteous and very professional. You have been listening. I have been to many meetings where they completely disregard the public. So thank you all for that. I really appreciate the professionalism. A couple quick points. Um, most of the stuff I've been doing the last four months has been helping um, parents fight against the mask mandates in schools. My friend Amy explained the documentation that the masks are hurting kids, physically and mentally, and psychologically, sorry, physically and psychologically. This gentleman over behind me here just um, made a point that most of the people in the hospitals are unvaccinated and that's why we have to wear a mask. Um, that's not true. The last four or five weeks, most of the people in the hospital have been vaccinated and are mask wearers. It's 70%. Another thing, not one of the masks you are wearing protects you. Look at the packaging. Laugh if you want, look at the packaging. Cloth mask cannot protect you. The mask you're wearing, sir, it is printed on the packaging, not for PPE. Personal protection. Not one of these masks are protecting you or anybody else. So it's time to stop it. It's certainly time not to criminalize people who are choosing to breathe, who are choosing to visit your city, your town, whatever it may be, to spend their money here. I live in Essex Junction. <laughs> Nobody I know is going to Burlington anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? You've heard these business owners. That's two minutes. Thank you much. I do want to thank you for your time. You've been professional on that. and. Uh, you paid everybody. Appreciate it. So, thank you. Thank you. Take the mask off. You're not helping. Mr. Boyd, I want to. Well, everybody else has pretty much said what I wanted to say, but I want to give a little history about last year when you guys passed your mandate before the state passed their mandate. So, before you go any further, Rick owns the mobile up here at yes. Billings Mobile. Um, yeah. and so, the minute you guys passed that mandate, my phone rang every day, every morning. I had to defend myself against people that said I was discriminating because I made them wear a mask or just I didn't make somebody wear a mask. Myself, my employees were put on the spot every single day. That wasn't fair to us. We had to call the cops several times because people were fighting in the yard. People were damaging other people's vehicles over this. It, it's, it's not, we're not the mass police. And I don't believe it's your job to pass this. It's the state's job to do it. And if you guys pass this, all phone calls are going to you guys. They're not coming to me, because you guys are gonna own it. I'm not gonna own this, not this time around. And none of my employees are going to suffer like they did last year. It's not fair to us. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Lyndon, come on up, and then Rob, and then I think we'll call it a night on the comments. Um, I'm going to read a statement. It takes about two minutes and 15 seconds to read. So, my name is Lyndon. I'm a resident of Waterbury. I'm here, but I'd rather be doing anything Can you speak else. up, dear? Yeah. They, they need speak up a little louder if you can. Can you not hear me? Yeah, either that or turn. Yeah, you can't turn around. All right. You've got this day. Okay. Okay. My name is Lyndon. I'm a resident of Waterbury. I'm here when I'd rather be doing anything else because of the potential radical criminalization and impoverishment of people and businesses being discussed and brought to bear down upon us based on coercion of medical products and our simple ability to breathe as each individual sees fit while going about the business of life. I could pour through the many harms of masking, which have been duly recorded from friable particulate inhalation and chronic inhalation of extremely carcinogenic chemicals, 
used on masks like ethylene oxide and synthetic fluoride, things you really ought not to be breathing in at all, to fungal and bacterial colonization, to psychological harms, which are many, to sociological harms, which we are living in part right now here at this meeting, um, or the immediate harm of having to work harder to obtain oxygen as the oxygen levels inside a mask drop below OSHA's safe levels within seconds. That's 17.4%, by the way. Or their incredible inefficacy as they simply create jets of air pushing out the sides and top, as anyone with common sense can tell you. But my main message tonight is a human one. It is simply wrong to force, coerce, fine, impoverish, stress, and divide people. A person must have autonomy over their own body. This is fundamental. As a woman, this is a recurring theme in my life, bodily autonomy. A subject I've always had at the forefront of my mind because politicians involve themselves where they should not. And now it has come to discussing criminalizing your neighbors and the local economy and making life ever more contentious, divided, and destructive. People must be able, at an individual level, to decide how they can breathe, <laughs> which I can't believe I have to say. <laughs> I, for one, have a hypoxic condition in my tissues. It's a strange inflammatory disease that I am not happy divulging to the public, but I am doing that to defend myself and others. I am always in some level of discomfort, ranging from a 4 to 10 on a pain scale. I'm like a barometer for how much oxygen and acid is in my tissues because it hurts and burns and causes scar tissue as areas struggle, and I can tell you masking does me harm. That is not anyone else's business. It's not your place to be coercing me into struggling or penalizing a business owner for not forcing me to struggle. It is wrong for me to have to even discuss such things with you or anyone else. It is up to me and any individual to simply go about their business as best they can. Privacy and Thanks, autonomy Linda. over... Linda. Let me, please let me finish. Yeah. Yeah. Privacy yeah. and autonomy yeah. over medical information. We've got to be, fair. Yeah. be yeah. fair to everyone. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank I wish you we could let you finish, but... Can I use the 45 seconds you'll admit with another person? <laughs> no. We were also supposed to stop at 920 and we're after that. That's okay. Yeah. Thanks, Kristen. For the Health Operations Center, I'm on a call with the governor every two weeks, uh, and uh, so I'm here to provide the facts. Uh, today, there were 78 hospitalizations, 21 were fully vaccinated. That's 27% a third in the hospital were fully vaccinated. Pre-Delta, the highest case count was 52 in the hospital. Uh, so we're up quite a bit. We're averaging about 70 to 80 a day. Uh, 25 are in the ICU today. Four of those are fully vaccinated. Uh, we're seeing about one to two hospitalizations for pediatric children every day. Uh, before the Delta variant, uh, there were zero. <laughs> uh, the governor generally uses his smallest number, which is about 20% fully vaccinated in the hospital. Uh, that ranges from 20 to 68% daily. 12 hospitals today reported elevated higher medical surge indicators. Two hospitals with no ICU beds, only nine available statewide. Uh, and a UVM has stopped elective surgeries. So Amy's point about wearing a mask in a hospital with an N95, I 100% agree, we wanna keep people out of the hospital. Uh, we're hurting hospital staff who have to wear this. Uh, my wife, uh, my mother-in-law are both hospital staff. They both cared for COVID patients. Uh, we forget that masks are hit there to protect others. I have three kids under four that can't get vaccinated. There's a lot of people out there that don't have children and don't realize that there's still a lot of people who need the added help and protection of masks. Uh, uh, so we still don't know the long-term effects of COVID. I have a 27-year-old coworker. Uh, he was otherwise completely healthy before COVID. He got COVID health and uh, two years later is still uh, serving long-term health yeah, effects. Two minutes now. Uh, I'd also point out that I'm a military family and that's a picture of a man wearing a mask in a desert with 150 pounds of uh, material on. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Okay, we're about 923, 922. He was also random. You forgot him. Real quick, two minutes. Thank you. Hello, neighbors. My, neighbor, my name is Brent Zlino. I'm a father and a homesteader living in nearby Warren. 
I'm here tonight to oppose a watery town ordinance that would compel the wearing of facial coverings and criminalize the free breathing of air in public buildings. Such a mandate is built on a multitude of presuppositions. First, there is an articulable problem in need of a solution. Second, that this policy would serve as a solution to the problem. And third, that the benefits of this policy outweigh the costs. I would argue that the answer is no to each of those presuppositions, and my natural inclination would then be to bolster my contentions with data and examples. I could talk about the distinction between respiratory droplets and droplet nuclei, as explained by the World Health Organization. I could talk about the scientific studies that deceptively report relative risk reductions over absolute risk reductions. I could talk about the metrics used to compile data and how these can be defined to return desired results. But tonight, I resist becoming mired down in the tangled weeds of wonkiness. Tonight, I would urge you to consider the more fundamental implications of what it is we're doing here. Every action that we take in the name of fighting COVID-19 sets precedent and pushes us farther down a slippery slope. Here, we are not yet confining people against their will to quarantine camps as they are in Howard Springs, Australia. But this is no longer as dismissible an idea as it once was. The same can be said of vaccine passports. I urge you to ask of yourselves what precedents we are setting with this mask policy. Consider that we have been urged to act as if we were all sick until proven healthy. We have been urged to act as if hypothetical harm of questionable and unmeasurable likelihood is actual harm. Consider that while we don't all subscribe to the same meta-narrative that informs our understanding of the world, we all love our friends and family and generally don't wish to harm others. And yet this policy would use the state's monopoly of power or force against those who disagree with it and would pose actual measurable harm to them in the loss of their bodily autonomy as well as their liberty and finances depending on enforcement and penalties. We've come a long way from two weeks to flatten the curve and the goalposts seem to continually shift. I don't believe that this policy will stop the goalposts. I think it will do the opposite. I urge you not to pass it. Thank you. Here, here. Okay. All right, people. Um, now it's the select board's turn to make comments and considerations. So who of you would like to go first? Mark, do you wish to come back to the table at all? Or are you going to... I stay refused. Okay. The general yep. All right. So go ahead, people. Who would like to okay. be first? Um, I'm not in favor of enforcing this mask mandate. I think it should be left up to each individual business if they want to reinstate themselves. And I don't think it's the business of the town to reinstate it. And if you don't like what the business has in place, don't shop there and don't uh, slander them. Um, Social media, like front porch farm. That's not what it's for. Mm -hmm. Ladies first. You know I might not respect <laughs> okay. gender norm stereotypes. Hey, I'll take off my Good mask. Job, um, just because I feel like if people could hear me better. <laughs> I'm very conflicted by mask mandates. I'm probably not for overall for for a mask mandate. I listen to what the experts say, both for and against. I try to think of myself as being a pretty critical thinker. Masking, I think, is a good thing, but I also think it's a personal choice that people, people take. I think every business can say, you need to wear a mask or you're not welcome in my business. Uh, I have even spoken to several business owners who want to go nameless, um, they basically felt that their businesses were more served by following CDC guidelines and, um, you know, the state does not have a, a, a mask mandate until the state has a mask mandate, they, they probably don't want to. They have stated that their employees are going to have an issue, but why if customers have the option not to wear a mask, why don't I? These are all personal, personal choices. I think people, you know, employers have the right to ask their employees things, you know, everything I know when I was an employee, I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. Uh, I just don't think as much as, you know, I have a 101 year old mother-in-law who's very susceptible. I have a 96 year old stepmom who I'm very concerned I wear a mask usually, and I have, have since infection rates have gone up indoors, I have worn a mask, whether they be acceptable or not, you know, you know, they work or not, 
I think it's my little part to do that. But I don't think it's something that we should enforce on everyone. I think it's going to affect the business owners. I think some of the business owners want a town mask man mandate because it just, I think as Rick kind of indicated, it just makes us, you know, us being the heavy to say, don't, don't, um, don't mask. I don't think we, we should be doing that. I think we're going down a real slippery slope, and I think we'd be a lot better off not enforcing a mandate. It's everyone's personal right. I think it's a great thing that you wear a mask. Again, I'm wearing a mask when I go into Shaw's now. I wear a mask in a lot of places that I wasn't this summer, uh, and that's my choice. Uh, again, I think business owners have that right now to say, we want to enforce a total mask mandate. And I think we go down a slippery slope by requiring a mask mandate because of what we're going to do is create more conflicts, more fights in stores. That's something I just don't want to see. And as much as I think, as I said, masks are, I think are a good thing, I just don't think the town should be mandating them. Thank you. Um, yeah, I am inclined to pass on a vote tonight and not vote in favor of the mandate, not because of theoretical slippery slope arguments or um, more emotional based reasoning, but because our town is doing really well. Our town has not shown transmission or severe illness rates that other towns have, um, and based on the information that I have, which is limited based on what the state and CDC are putting out, our town seems to be doing very well, um, and it doesn't seem to make sense for us right now at this point. Um, so I think that's where I'll end. I do want to echo what Katie said. There are business owners. We've all said this. It's up to the business owners. But we can say it in here and then not follow through with that. Um, yeah, we want to be respectful of those businesses and make sure that we're not berating them in person, online, et cetera. Um, it's there. We're, we're talk, if we're talking about choice, we want to respect there. So that's that's really important. So you're sitting the closest to me. Are you going to flip out if I remove my mask to speak? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody coming here tonight and weighing in on this issue. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, after living in this community as long as I have, um, being involved in the select board for coming on nine years now, the issues that I've been through as a select board member with the community involved, with very contentious, very important things, decision making that this town has had to go through, I've come to the conclusion that we're a bunch of pretty smart, intelligent people here. And, you know, we've been going through some rough times here recently with other issues, you know. Uh, we're muddling through it. Um, I think we're all starting to coalesce around the fact that we can look towards each other and count on each other um, when things really get tough. Um, I think that it's not the board's position to dictate what people should be doing with their businesses and how they should be operating and how people should be conducting themselves amongst each other. I think we're smart enough. After two years of being through the COVID already, we've gained enough information uh, and uh, on both sides, you know, I mean, it, it's getting to the point where you don't really know what the truth is anymore. But I think that we've all learned enough through boiling down all this confusion that we have made good choices in this town. And I think it's the business owners and the residents' opportunity to continue to do those th those smart things uh, to help each other get through this because let's face it if our businesses fail here uh, through either people fighting or you know I, rick told me uh, 
the other day when I was speaking to him, um, not only is he having difficulty finding help, but he's also having more difficulty finding product to keep on the shelves for people. And a mask mandate would just be another, or could be the possible final nail in the coffin. So uh, I agree with the rest of the select board. I'm glad we're all on the same page on this. And uh, if you can tell me if this would be the right motion, but could we move to table this indefinitely? Or how? what is the right procedure to, uh, you know, I'm even afraid of turning it back over to the legislatures for fear that they would, you know, go against the wishes of, of I'm glad they put it in our hands as, as a local town uh, legislative body um, because I think we need to be, have the choice to do what we think is right for ourselves. Yeah, so, so, so what, what moving to table it indefinitely is fine if you want to propose adopting it and then voting it down. That works just as well. Do um, you mind if I say something? Sure. All right. So I'm, I'm not a board member, I don't get a vote, um, and I appreciate hearing all of uh, what the folks have said who feel that it's not the right thing to do, and I'm, I respect that, and if the board votes not to have a mandate, I, I respect that and live by that. I'm not advocating for a mandate. I would, however, ask all of us um, to understand, though, that there are laws and rules that there are very few laws and rules that are unanimous when they're when they're adopted. Uh, we live in a country and in a state and a town. I hope where the rule of law is respected and obeyed. And if a town decides that it's in their best interest to have a mask mandate, and you choose not to go there, that's fine, that's within your right. Uh, if a business chooses to say, you need a mask to come in my business, and you choose not to go in there, that's fine, and that's right, and I respect your, your decision. But if, if a business does say, you need a mask to come in here, I would also ask you to respect the business owner's right to decide that's what's best for them and not go in and defy people who are trying to protect themselves and their customers in the best way that they see fit. And as long as we, if, if there, I do not deny there's been divisiveness about this issue and, and many issues over the past couple of years, but we cannot pick and choose the laws that we obey. We should not. And if you oppose a law, that's great. You should work to overturn it. I respect that. But if a law is adopted, if a rule is adopted, if a business owner says, you need a mask to come in my business, please respect them and, and do what they ask, or don't go in. Don't go in and make a scene and say, this is, a, you know, violates my rights. Be respectful of the people who own that property and who run that business. Thank you. So one other, one other quick comment there, and, and you can uh, speak, Katie, um, for what it's worth. Uh, Friday, after, Friday morning, I came home from northern Maine. I've been up stumbling through the woods for six weeks. Um, I was listening to a radio program, it was a scientific radio program about the COVID, and I heard something that kind of stunned me a little bit. Uh, they said that if you took all of the particles of the COVID virus that has infected all the people on the planet, brought it all together, packed it all up, you could fit every bit of it inside of a soda can. That's how minute, nano, <clears throat> these particles are. Uh, so, you know, it's been my thought that these haven't worked for some time. Uh, but it's, that's just a little tidbit of information that kind of floored me when I, when I heard it, um, that those particles are really that small. Go ahead, Katie. I was just going to ask Bill if we need a motion, and if we do, I'll make one. 
Or can we do we need to take action? Or? I think if, if, yeah. you don't, if you don't take the action, nothing happens. Yeah, I think the tabling idea is the right way to go. Yeah, okay. Can't, I think can't we just we can table consensus? it, and if it needs, yeah. and if things go out of whack, and we need to bring it back up, we can. I think you can just say. The, the no take, action was taken. Yeah. That, right, no action. action. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. I think, yeah, I think we just did. On to the next. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. What, what, what was the result of It's been tabled, so no, there's We chose to do nothing. So, so everything. What does that mean? So that means that things are, things are back to the way they were. There's no mandate. There's no mandate. It's an elbow town. Thank you. Barry City did the same thing. They're not ordering us to make out business. It's under law. By the way, I got COVID for five more weeks. And you're all going to die someday like me. That's a matter of just live your life. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Good comments, Will. Thank you to your. Uh... Can anybody post a picture of a soldier wearing a mask? We still need to finish our meeting. Yeah. Yeah. We can move all the conversation out in the hall and come so we can finish one more. Yes. Okay, Mark. In the meantime, thank you all for your courtesy. We appreciate you coming. Thank you for your work. Take care. No, exactly. That's what I figured. So there's no comments. So the last thing on the agenda is just the, the training issue. Oh, that's right. Two things. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Can we move? We'll take about five minutes if that. Can you move your discussion on the hallway, please? We have some discussion on the hallway. Yeah. Thank you. Um, schedule the uh, training with Mary. Yeah, so initially um, we had talked a couple weeks ago about the potential of board members being uh, available in the late afternoon. Um, Mary Shannon uh, had, had uh, scheduled, had, had kept tonight at 7 o'clock as the time that she might be able to be here. Um, when I was talking to her about maybe we could do it in the afternoon, she said, well, she had a meeting in Mutland at 2 o'clock, and then she had another meeting somewhere else later, and it wasn't going to work. And then by that time, several of these issues started coming up, so we weren't going to have enough time anyway tonight. So um, your next regularly scheduled meeting is on Monday, December 20th. Uh, that's uh, holiday week, Christmas week. Um, and maybe people don't want to meet that close to the holidays. Um, Mary is available on the 20th if you'd like to have her come and have uh, kind of a one issue agenda, which is the training. I think she's able to come in the, in the afternoon if, if you can do it. Um, she's also available on <laughs> Tuesday, December 14th or Wednesday, December 15th. So uh, the board had indicated that it would like one more opportunity for this training. If you still feel that way, I think it's either December 14th, 15th, or 20th. And if it's none of those three work out, we got to push it into February or March. I can't do the 20th, but I'm happy to do the 14th or 15th. Are you talking about 4 o'clock, though? What? Or whatever they decide. What the board's pleasure is, I believe she's available in the afternoon if you want to have it for Yeah. Two. I can also do, probably do the 20th. I'm probably going to be leaving for, um, I might be. So I might be online, you know, but but for an in-person training like that. Yeah, I probably should be here for that. Huh? Well, yeah, I think that would be just the 14th or 15th? The 14th or 15th. The 14th or 15th, I can make that those happen. The 15th is preferable. I have a Waterbury Rotary uh, Recreation Committee meeting between 5 to 6, but I could beg out of that. Um, so the 15th is preferable. 
I have the hockey games the 15th, 18th, and 20th. So the 14th will work for me. <laughs> so I told her, I said, um, Asking them what will probably end up with two this day, two that day, and one. <laughs> so, anyway. so, right now, why don't you just pull 14th? 14th, that's fine. Can you make it to 14th, Mike? Yep, I could make it work. Just, um, it would have to be, I have rehab uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, so I didn't think it would be that early. It won't be any earlier than four. Okay, that's what I thought. So, all right. I can do it for you. So 14th at 4 o'clock? So, uh, how long? 4 7? Uh, I think it'd probably be 4 to 6, 6.30. Okay. And, and we'll try to make it the only issue on the agenda. Okay. Um, and then no meeting on the 20th? Yeah, it sounds like several of them can't make it. I could make a 7, I just couldn't do anything before, but that works for the, if we do now, all I, the I think I, I think if we can. You know, I'm starting to work on as much as I'll be getting the information. If we want to have this training on the 14th and then just kind of target the first Monday in January to kind of start that sprint, we can do it. You'll be happy to hear, Bill, there's five Mondays in January. Yeah, how about that? So, <laughs> so you get two an more extra whole week. Finish one under one. Okay. Three of us. Uh, two, I think. Well, <laughs> it depends. Anyway, do so you you don't think we should meet on the? I mean, I, trust me, I'm not trying to throw another meeting in there, but this is a pretty big conversation. Yeah, yeah that um, if you want to try to do that, on the, I don't know if you want to meet alone. Or yeah, we, I mean, we could just meet and then we, the we can meet individually person. and try to, because some of this is so hard to discuss in a meeting. Right. So um, what I was tr asking, Mark, was um, you want to meet just as a select board and not include the info commissioners, or were you looking to try to find a date where both boards could? Um, I, think, I think it depends on what their meeting is like this Wednesday okay. and what, and I don't know how much that they need to unpack to, because obviously in the end of the day, they they won't exist as an entity, right? Right. So that's well, how that. I hope. Right. <laughs> but how that plays out is significant. Right. We know we will exist either way. Right. So I think there's a lot of question marks of what they are going to do to either decide they want to move forward and. and they can do certain things like you talked about without our, you know, they can vote on how they manage their debt prior to right. any kind of murder. Right. And I think they would. Um, I think that's something that they would, that's something that they have to take up. <laughs> and the fact that I'm recommending now, you know, restructuring that as opposed to forgiving it completely, like, I think that will make it easier for some of them to consider that. Yep. I still think it's, I mean, obviously, yeah. obviously, if the board has an opinion on specifically that, should off give it to Bill or the e flag Commission or send it to me so we can relay that. If we think that that is a direction we're going to end up, then it's potentially it's an asset of right. e flag currently that you know we should definitely think about. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think. I mean. Do we, do we have time to have a conversation ourselves on this and then any questions that might arise that pertain like right to now? E no. <laughs> at another meeting. Uh, sure. And then any questions that might arise that we would well, have for EFUD, they yeah. could right. either address them at a joint meeting or. We will we'll have time after the diversity training. We might be able to hash it around. Yeah, not, and I believe the I, training. I think, you know, that's, the up, that's up to the board. Be three hours. The, the training, I think it will be, I think it will be two hours with a, a break. So I think that that would be from like four to six, 30, and it would be done. And if the board wants to talk about this afterwards, you yeah. certainly can do that. But it's, it's the board's choice. Well, I think maybe we can have two of us meet with you and just talk this through in more detail so we can be more knowledgeable on it. Maybe get an update on that meeting on what EFA discussed this week. And we can all also look at the minutes or watch the meeting. And then obviously our 
direction yeah. bound by what they decide they want to do on their side. So. That, that's a good idea. And there's, you know, that's that's a good suggestion, Matt, because the the EFUD commission is also a five-member board, so it's potential that you could each board could appoint two representatives to meet with me to try to talk about things. Uh, when they were, you know, two boards of three, a water commission of three and then trustees of three, only, you know, one could come. Can, can this really be done without going to the voters? This seems like a pretty big, like, obviously EFUD, I don't even know how EFUD works fully in terms of, like, their decision body and if they ever have to go out to their user base. No. But for us, there seems to be decisions that we are required to go to the voters. And this seems like, I mean, obviously there's assets, so there's. I'm, I'm not suggesting yeah. that the voters are left out of this. Okay, yeah, I just, I wanted to so understand the, that part. Of I, it. I believe the law would allow the select board to make decisions about appropriating ARPA money without having to get a town-wide vote, I would not recommend doing that. I think this is something that, you know, it's a it's a process and the select board ultimately can put things in its budget or if they feel even more transparency is necessary, can put special articles in that can be discussed and talked about. I'm not suggesting that this be done without public input or comment. And that six hundred thousand dollars that's being suggested is basically it's almost like the purchase of EFUD, right? If we want to represent it, is that like you're suggesting that we appropriate six hundred thousand dollars to EFUD only if the merger would move forward? No, right? no, I didn't okay. say that. So you're suggesting we do six hundred thousand dollars, whether or not? Yes, the the, okay. the merger. That's that's. I, I haven't talked about that with anybody. I think that ultimately is the best outcome in this, but the getting that water system in the uh, Peck Mobile Home Park on Young yeah. Flats upgraded and in public ownership completely is a good goal. Um, the ARPA money can't be used um, for surface transportation, so bridges, culverts, roads, you can't use the ARPA money for that. You can use it for water and sewer. The town doesn't right, have right. any water and We're sewer in town have that, so they can just immediately. So you them. have the ability to uh, sub-grant, if you will, that money to the entity that does have that responsibility. So the $600,000 going to EFUD, what I see that as is the quid pro quo for getting the revolving loan fund, which if the loan is restructured or forgiven, they are about even value. That you give them $600,000 so they can deal with the tech mobile home park. That is their bailiwick, that's their responsibility, that's their mission is to provide water. It happens to be, you know, town residents outside of the political boundaries of EFUD, which are your responsibility. You know, there's no fire hydrants in, in that in that mobile home park. You can oh, geez, you can get uh, you can get I think that's the building, right? Yeah. yeah. The past yeah. Yeah. Of the you can get the uh, you can get the uh, you know good water supply distribution system for those customers and fire hydrants, which is a benefit. And then, so you've given $600,000, and EFUD gives you the revolving loan fund. Whether EFUD stays in existence as a water and sewer district going down the road, I think it is, it's not a good thing for them to do. The owl went out. EFUD, EFUD, under their current configuration as a utility district, being in control of a revolving loan fund that's used for economic development and business development, I think that's much better to have that to have. So one of my anyway, main concerns so. or wants is that we get input from the stakeholders like EFUD and the ice rink and then additionally the public. 
So I know it's hard to schedule meetings and figure that all out. I, I, so I don't know how to make that work yeah, the best this, way. But. This, this is not necessarily something that has to all be decided At even by time. town meeting. I sure. mean, you know, the, the ARPA money you found until 2026 yeah. to, to have to spend that money, yeah. there's plenty of time. Just yeah, I'm not worried about I'd like to be around while you're making this. <laughs> yeah. so, there's a little bit of a clock ticking there. Go ahead, Katie. I just, Bill, I'm wondering, do I have a conflict of interest because I work on another board that purchases ice time and things from the rink or work no. with them? Okay. No. So to your point, Mark, when you said something about having a, you know, two board members meet with him to get more into the weeds on this, personally, I, I don't wouldn't want any of us board members to be out of the loop on this. Sure. Um, if that's sure. Okay, I'm just that's trying okay to think how we do it, because I think it's hard sometimes. Like tonight was an almost impossible situation. This is the first time I, we, we met a while back to talk about the transfer of land, and it was like literally at the end of the meeting was like, at some point, EFUD probably merges. That's the last time I we even talked about this. So. Right. I think that there, we have to start, especially something as big as this, there should yeah, be. Exactly. And, and if, since your advice, if you want to be part of the discussions with Bill in that level, but I think there has to be some work that's done outside of meetings on this. There's just too much. And then you can yeah. share notes, right? With yeah, us. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, and then we can, we can yeah. I can communicate out on a one-on-one -on -one basis as far as I know. Yeah. Um, but I think that we have to do it that way. I just don't see how we could do yeah, this all in a special way. meeting. You know. Well, we could do special meeting, but there's literally just there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's, there's some there's stuff here that stuff. I just don't think needs needs to necessarily happen in front of the public just to talk through can all we of cut out? just just shorten the. No, it's just there's, not cut out. But there's I mean. plenty of there's similar to <laughs> if we you know talk about hiring somebody that there can be plenty of conversation that happens outside of meetings. Right. Just to better prepare the board for decisions that I think we just have to do on this. There's just there's a lot here. So I just think it makes sense that, uh, you know, we just have to set up some meetings outside of, I mean, if, if we're allowed to do it, we need to do it. This is an important decision. And I, any board member can communicate with Bill, myself, or other members individually on this to try to work through this. But this is, this is a... Right. This is this is a weird scenario that merger didn't happen years ago, and now we're working our way through. Right, and, so. and you know, I I had an internal debate with myself about you know do I just kind of do what I did tonight and share it? That's why I wanted it to be a joint meeting, or send it out early. And and I wasn't trying to keep people in the dark, but I also wanted to kind of say it all at once to everyone, understanding that there's a lot to unpack, there's a lot to understand, I didn't anticipate. Everyone was gonna say, yeah, this is the greatest idea I've ever heard all together tonight. But I felt if I sent it out in advance, A, it would have required not doing it tonight, and then we, because I wouldn't have time. I mean, this is something that's been percolating in my head for a while, but, um, I also didn't want to send it out and then have individuals all coming back with all their suggestions at the meeting. I just needed to get it out on the table to say there's things that we have an opportunity here. My ideas aren't necessarily the best ever, but at least it's a place to start a conversation. So is, everybody heard it and now... Since it's not our, you know, that, that debt isn't ours. Can we put some of that onus on any decision on what to do with that debt on? Yeah, that, that has nothing to do with the debt has nothing to do on with who? The time. Well, e, it's EFUD's it's e revolving loan account, right? That ultimately came from a, uh, Ben and Jerry's. That's the beginning of that was money that came and right. created this revolving loan fund. I think if we all have an opinion, we should give it to EFUD, which I am planning to do after this meeting. I just think that to, to, there's a conversation surrounding the merger of the two entities. There's a whole other conversation around what to do with their assets, which is that revolving loan fund is one of them. Um, I'm not saying it's the wrong decision, but it is a weird pressure for us. I think a lot of us, were, at least myself, focused on that conversation was a lot of thinking through like that debt relief, but it's really not ours yet. 
Right. It could be. It could be an asset that we get yeah. for yeah. BFUD, but I don't know how, say they don't do it, and then there's maybe a cost to us. So there's a conversation. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I did not, and if I, if I telegraphed that both boards have to agree on this as a single unit, it's a complete package, that's not what I meant at all. I was just saying, these are elements of what I'm thinking about. It is absolutely EFUD's responsibility and authority to decide what to do with that debt revolving loan fund until the point they decide to give it to you. And then it's yours. And that is what you want to hear about EFUD. They, 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 they may decide, you know what, we, we're not interested. They might say that they're not interested in any of this, you know? Sure. Um, I think they'll be interested in, and we have, we haven't talked about PAC, but there's a couple of things that are like that, but I, I have no idea what their reaction will be because I'll find out on Wednesday. So these are just all pieces of the puzzle and it is absolutely their authority to make a decision. I think that probably they will decide to restructure, I hope, and that way it preserves the debt on the balance sheet and as I said, I felt I started thinking like, geez, if they forgive this and then somebody comes in and buys it, and turns the place into it's not an ice center anymore, it's an indoor soccer facility, it's a warehouse, you know, that person gets to skate away without having to make you find whole for that loan. And I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. So anyway, we we've been here a long time. We've yeah. been talking more about this. No. Um, we're on other business, but there's the Rotary and Tom Messner discussion. Um, are we good to move on to the Rotary? Yeah, they're very quick. Uh, just so, I'm a Rotarian. Just, uh, just so, just in behalf of the Rotary, it's kind of timely that it came came with your your decision. Uh, the Rotary really values Bill what you do, and just as a little token of of the Rotary. Here's a $50 gift certificate to Pro Pig. Um, Pro Pig, Head of the Woods, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all of Eric's uh, entities. And enjoy it. Have a couple of beers or some pork or whatever. So we, we really, the Rotary really appreciates what you do. Well, that's good timing. <laughs> no, it was kind of, it's your first going away present. <laughs> Thank you to the Rotary. Uh, this is, I don't know. I was thinking about this. I went to um, Tom Messner's, you know, last day in Burlington. My wife loves Tom Messner, but I'm not doing it because of that. But I just think he's been so instrumental to the whole Champlain Valley, you know, Vermont, New York community in his 31 years doing, and it's not just doing weather. You know, people always think of, him, he always, I, we love how he always says, chief meteorologist. Matter of fact, I'm going to take this off. Um, he does, he's so community minded. All the charities that he does, it's just something I felt like, especially with um, December 21st being the first day of, of winter, Waterbury and just could take a proclamation. This December 21st is Mark Mes uh, Tom Messner Day in the town of Waterbury, and I would be glad to write up a proclamation uh, in behalf of that. And you know, maybe we could just pre pre present to him in in, in leaving. I, I know where he is. You know, post his, his retirement. <laughs> so just something to throw out. I don't know if any if you're pro against you know, et cetera. Have, have we done something? I, I, I think I'm fine with it. Have we done anything similar to this? Is, there, is this totally unique to? Uh, a few years ago, you did a recognition of Ken Squire when he was being inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and you know, kind of had a proclamation in support of him and what he'd done for that at the community. Yeah. And so. People who do that kind of work, just, it's the recognition. He, he's, he's not going to care if, you know, 
we, we give him you know anything I think he'll and as a matter of fact we might get a good little news story invite Channel 5 you know up to up, up to Waterbury we you know make the proclamation that it's um, you know Tom, Tom the 21st is Tom Messner day in the day of Waterbury and he, he, I bet he would show up so you're, you're you're asking that we do this as the kind of the, the Waterbury's baby uh, basically in behalf of president to him right basically that we thank you know thank him for 31 years of service to the <laughs> community and it's kind of like you know what we've done for Ken Squire all he's done for our community I think it's nice that we recognize those those people and he's very out front you know being on TV we recognize our you know TV folks and stuff like that you know a lot more than you know some other folks and just so are, are we going to cause angst for the people in Waterbury who prefer to watch Sharon Bynum on WCAX and didn't do anything when she retired? Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know what? If people are that petty, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just say, well, hey, maybe we should have done something for Sharon Meyer. But I would, I would look, rather be remembered for the first day of spring than the first day of winter. <laughs> He's a skier, though. We'll say that for you. I just say because the time, the only reason I would do it for the 21st of December because he just retired, and you know. To wait till 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 spring. No, I just I, 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 no, I, I, I understand. Uh, yeah, I don't see why not. I can't think of a reason yeah. not to. I think it's a Cost kind of piece of paper and maybe yeah. get some good publicity. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why we couldn't do it. I think it's fine. I mean, I, should it? Could we? Does it need to come through the town or could it come through RW and just? Mm. I don't know. Just. I I think it's nice as. The town select board, where basically make I, I I don't know if the RW can make it Tom Tom Eschner Day. They can maybe informally do that, but sure. yeah, I know we don't have a key to the, the city or something like that. that. He brings on the presenter. We vote through. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. I could put something up, a sort of proclamation for everyone's purview and. Sure. Yeah. Um. Any other business? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, I kind of like to address this issue here in this room. Um, somebody can remind me how this came about, the, the requirement to wear masks uh, while we were here. Was this prior to the shutdown or what? How what we've about? said is that if you're not vaccinated, you need to wear a mask in this building. That's kind of CDC guidelines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess on that basis, maybe I can structure my argument. Um, it's become clear and proven that uh, even though people are vaccinated these days, they can till, still transmit the disease. Um, you bet. And it's my personal opinion that you know if you've been vaccinated. Uh, based on what I've witnessed, if you've been vaccinated, there's a pretty good likelihood that you can be asymptomatic uh, and still pass the virus on and not know it. Um, somebody like me who's not vaxxed, um, when I get sick, I'm going to know it. Uh, in fact, um, at the end of August, um, and nothing t to you, but the, the day you came down to see me, uh, that next morning, I was sick for four days, uh, had body fatigue, uh, achy body, sore throat, loss of taste. Um, I thought you also thought you had it back at the right, meeting. You tell me two years prior, yeah, but I had it for four weeks at one time. Uh, and that's, that's a whole other. So I related those two together because the symptoms were the same. It's just the first time it lasted four weeks, but this time it lasted four days. And I actually was able to work through it. Um, I was working up on the ring road there on that project. And uh, at one point, I had to stop the machine because the fatigue uh, being in that machine, you know, got to me to the point where I had to put my head back and sleep for half an hour. But uh, I was able to work through it. But um, 
back to the point of, of the mask in here um, and the fact that now we know that it can be transmitted by people who have been vaccinated as well as people who have not been vaccinated to, and I'm not blaming anybody or criticizing anybody, I'm just pointing out some things that I've witnessed, uh, to sit here and not say anything and wear a mask um, is okay. But then when you go to speak, to take the mask off, probably when it should be on at the most important time, if you believe that masks really work, um, that's the worst possible time to not have the mask on. And uh, so I want to either be all inclusive in this or not at all. Uh, and I would ask the board to think about that. And, you know, if it requires us, if I need to sit over here and the rest of you can sit over here, if, they're, if, they're, if you're that afraid of the issue, um, uh, we can do it. But uh, I think under the circumstances, uh, I'd rather see, you know, all or none. Uh, Chris, you make some very good points. I'm just very hesitant because I'm a big believer in science and I try to, you know, I know there's all people who believe in conspiracy theories and stuff like that of government, but I think the mask mandate we are referring to is based upon CDC guidelines. And I'm just going to trust the scientists, you know, for good or bad. I know people don't trust, you know, Biden, you know, I trust Dr. Fauci over probably anyone in the United States. And he's he's given a recommendation. He's actually for like what well, you know, he was not for making indoor mask mandates like they, they wanted. There are very few states now that have mask mandates, you know, for indoors. I'm glad that we're not going down that route. But also I think whatever we could do to help, you know, I, I you, you could transmit COVID just as well as, you know, I have a friend who just got COVID and he was anti-vax and I've been trying to talk him into getting vaccinated until I'm blue in the face and he hasn't. But I just think we need some sort of standard and using that CDC guideline, I think is a, is a reasonable, and it's nothing against you, Chris, but I think. So, are you, so what bothers me is that I don't know if it's the if it's I feel discriminated that you automatically think because I'm not vaccinated that I'm contaminated. No, and that's simply not the case. I'm as healthy of a horse as at mm -hmm. 62 years old as I just spent six weeks pounding my ass through the woods every day for hours on end through obstacle courses. That I mean, you walk through the woods up here, it's a cakewalk compared to up there in northern Maine. I you know I did show Mark pictures of ruts that are this deep in the woods every 50 feet apart with logging debris that yeah. most person people couldn't even crawl through uh, but anyway um, so I, I guess I'm try, trying to figure out if people who are vaxxed can still pass it on through being asymptomatic what makes that any different than me not being vaxxed and assuming that I'm I've got the COVID uh, so are you saying I, that I, we should I, all be masked or I, I, only I people that I are think, vaxxed? I think they're on the other scenario too, which I do believe that there is a war on science right now. I really do. And I, I believe in vaccines. I believe that they are saving lives. Me too. And I think it's us being responsible as a community to say, if you're not going to get a vaccination, I do believe masks work. I think certain masks work better than other masks but I think it's a protection for you. And I know that you might not agree with me, but I do believe that. And I know that there's a lot of misinformation around vaccines, but I do believe if you look at the data surrounding the hospitalization and death rate of people that are unvaxxed and vaccinated, it's proven that vaccines are working. So I think that that's, it's not so much the concern of someone who's unvaxxed giving it to a vaccinated person, it's also for your protection. And I think that, and, and maybe you might not agree with that. I, I understand there's plenty of people tonight that didn't believe that masks do anything. I, I understand that. I don't believe that. 
I don't. The other thing is, it's not just you. So if it was us in a vacuum, we could maybe make a decision and like do distancing. But if we're welcoming in the public and we're holding different standards for them right. and you, then we're super hypocritical about it. And I'm not comfortable saying that we can have 50 people in this room of, uh, like, you know you're healthy maybe, right? But I don't know about everyone who's coming in here. People make choices to go to public places sick all the time. I don't assume that about people, but we know it's true. So I don't know how we would say, you know, it's, we want people who are unvaccinated to come here with masks except for you, well, you know, except for one who, person. Who's going to police whether or not they are vaxxed? We're not. We're going to hold people, just like we talked about with the businesses, we're just going to hope that people respect the rules of the place they choose to attend. And that's, so why, I, that's why I said what I said, because we have a sign on the door that says if you're not vaccinated, you need a mask in here. And I guarantee you that almost every one of those people, well, I shouldn't say everyone, a lot of the people who spoke tonight who are anti-mask are also anti-vax, and they don't want to be told what to do, but they also aren't respectful of rules that have been made. Well, I don't even think we need to make assumptions or generalizations. I just think if we just look at, like, just look at what, what the, building rule is, and, and, and like you said, keep it the same for everyone, except That's a what I mean is like with the, in accordance to the, the guideline based on data. Well, I, I want everybody to know that I'm not opposing getting vaccinated just because, okay? I do, other than going to the chiropractor, <laughs> my wife is constantly bellering on me that I need to go get a checkup, you know? I just, I, I just, if I can stay out of the doctor's office, I'm happy as a clam. Um, there may come a point in the future when there's no other choice if I want to continue, continue to live. But at, at this point in my life, I, I'm relying on my body uh, to protect me, and and uh, I guess that's it in a nutshell. Um, so I guess, I mean, I. I I've got well, the opinion of the board, so nothing changes. At I this think point. speaking for the people that work in this building, uh, I think we can live without a mask mandate, but I think we all appreciate the rule that we have now that says if you're not vaccinated, you need a mask. And I, I would recommend that we continue that. That's right, because we have young children and grandchildren that are trying to protect. Right. Well, me as well. And um, just, just as a final comment, um, we don't know whether this is going to uh, be allowed to stand or not because the, um, the U.S. Department of Labor rule that requires employee, employers of over 100 people to have uh, a standard that says the employees need to be vaccinated or they need to be tested once a week. Uh, if that rule is allowed to stand, is it overturned by the courts? It will be in place oh. for the town of Waterbury. It is a rule that is um, enforced on, uh, at a point in time. So right now, um, we don't have 100 employees. Volunteer firefighters, if they're paid like ours, count. So there's 44 people right there. Board members who are paid a stipend count. So there's five there, so we're up to 50. And we have EFUD and town employees. We can leave the EFUD out for now until we merge. But the regular full and part-time employees for the town are a little bit more than 20. But once June gets here, and we hire all the recreation employees that we have to have to run our rec programs. I mean, we'll be close even before June comes because we have after school programs, there's recreation programs that are on now. So it may be even more than just if you're not vaccinated, you gotta wear a mask in, in, in the buildings of the town. Uh, we may be in a position that we have to tell our employees you have to be vaccinated or you're going to have to get tested. Uh, and that, you know, if it stands, that's, that's a rule 
with the force of law. And it's a, it will be enforced by OSHA and VOSHA for the state of Vermont. And we've been advised by Vermont leader cities and towns that uh, just to be prepared for it. So just, just understand that. And it makes it, you know, it's not fun. No. I mean, it's not fun because I respect if people don't want to get vaccinated, that's that's sure right. Yeah, but, I mean, for me, it's nearing the, the, the point of tyranny. Um, and I but hope, anyway, I hope it doesn't come to that. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Right. Appreciate everybody. Thanks, everyone. It was Thank you, everyone. Recording stopped.